attention is really shifting to the earnings season. The Max 7 is not uh, particularly where you want to be, but you have to look at tech overall and really bet on quality, strong balance sheet. You want to see some earnings momentum in the other parts of the market. We are looking at this sort of broadening out of the recovery as the earnings story gets better for the have-nots of 2023. I just look at what's been happening to this economy, and I do think that we're going to be able to avert a recession. So we'll continue to see earnings continue to move higher. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Let's get you to the weekend. Wait a second, I'm not allowed to do that just yet. Good morning. Welcome back from New York City. Uh, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Uh, John Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. John is off today. Manis Cranny, I am very pleased to say, is in the hot seat. I'm sure you are very pleased about it, too, on a Friday morning. We got CPI. We got PPI coming up next on the slate. We get bank earnings in Manis. The real question is, how much will that shift a narrative at a time where the banks warn about weakness and then deliver record gains. Well, the question is going to be, by the way, when the call went at 3.15 a.m. this morning to say, ah, joint surveillance, it was like, ah, you know, what a golden moment. Um, you're right. I think it's going to be the difference between the guidance, which is about net interest income, and we know that that's going to perhaps be revised higher because we're in a higher for longer rate. But go back to what Jamie Dimon says. He's still not completely sure. There's a 70 to 80 percent chance the market thinks it's a soft landing. And I believe the odds are a lot lower. What is the rhetoric and the guidance on the consumer? Full stop. That's absolutely what people are going to be watching for. And just to sort of guidepost you, 6.45 a.m., so about 45 minutes from now, we're expecting to get J.P. Morgan. Within that time, 6.45 to 7, Wells Fargo, 8 a.m., we're going to get Citigroup. That's the expectation. In the meantime, markets are fascinating at this moment because we're looking at a situation where bonds are still kind of reeling, getting a little bit of a reprieve, but otherwise still kind of reeling after the CPI print we got on Wednesday. Stocks are reviving a bit, though. And, Amory, I find this fascinating because it really raises a question. Is this a market that can withstand yields where they are? And also the fact that you're seeing a lot of notes come out talking about potentially this no landing scenario, given where we are. The reason why earnings, I think, is also so important is because of all the data we've already gotten. This is the last leg of data to understand where we are in this economy. And I go back to what Mohamed El Arian told us on Tuesday. He said everyone that got transitory wrong in 2021, they were looking at aggregate data, which is backward looking. They weren't listening to the earnings calls and what CEOs were saying, saying in terms of in the inflation outlook. Not all CEOs are the same, man. And I'm struck by the fact that, yes, we are seeing a rally, but it's really specific. And it's not Russell 2000. Yeah, it got a little bit of a blip up, but it's so far behind where it was before that CPI print. It really was Magnificent Seven roaring back. Amazon joining the Fab Five in terms of a new record. I mean, how much is this just basically going back to what people know and the sort of havens that are continuing to deliver outsized gains. Look, this takes you back to the, the view. Houses like State Street are espousing this view, which is you have a barbell approach to risk. On one side is cash, and we can talk more about that in a moment in terms of the allocation to cash. But it is about where the resilience is, even in the face of higher for longer, call it four, four and a half percent, five percent, whatever it is. And at the moment, the market is stuck at around this five percent, potentially no cuts at all. And with that in mind, you've got a high cash generating, solid balance sheets. And that's what gives the resilience to megatech. Which is the reason why I think a lot of people are a little bit confused about the price action, or maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Because on one hand, is this sort of the broadening out concept that people have been talking about? Or are we looking at the Mag 7 or the Mag 5? Fab Five, Fab One uh, being truly extraordinary. Let's just take a look at the scores for a second before uh, we get to the commodity space, because I really do want to dig into what's happening there. You are seeing a bit of a decline. I mean, to talk about two tenths of a percent uh, being a decline. S&P futures basically meandering here. The euro continuing to decline. 106.60, really getting close to that 105 level uh, that we were expecting or hearing about from Jane Foley after the ECB seems almost certainly ready to cut rates in June. The 10-year yield uh, just sort of dipping a little bit after crossing straight through 455, 453.38. Crude, let's get there. Anne-Marie, up uh, 1.3 percent. You could see it across the commodity complex. Gold hitting a new all-time high. A lot of people talking about the unrest in the Middle East and how this is directly a result of that. That's right. You're seeing a lot of geopolitical risk across the commodity space this morning. And this is Israel's bracing for this potential attack. Now, we had written about this yesterday. Bloomberg News talking about an imminent attack could come in the coming days. There was something that tangible happened yesterday, which I think is interesting. The U.S. government to the U.S. embassy in Israel is telling the personnel and their families 
don't leave major areas like Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. So when you start to see signals from either the U.S. government or Israel in terms of airspace, in terms of embassies, don't travel to certain places, that's when potentially we could be on the brink of this response. I think the, the, the important thing here is to define what is the scale of the response. And this is ref not necessarily reflected in the oil prices so far. We caught up with Rapid and Energy. They said at the moment you've got an oil market which reflects a couple of bucks, three, four, five bucks maximum of geopolitical risk. Because there is no escalation within the Persian Gulf, and this is critically important to the supply of oil, midstream, downstream, and upstream. The tension is in the Red Sea. The tension is not in the Persian Gulf. If there is a major escalation on Saudi soil, offshore, onshore, in the Persian Gulf, you are looking at potentially a $40 spike in oil. That's a 30% probability of that event risk under Rapidin. That's not the narrative that's coming through right now. Well, that is not the narrative. And yet, if that does happen, certainly that'll cause some serious waves. So, uh, coming up on the show, Jonathan Stubbs of Berenberg as stocks and treasuries reset after this week's hot CPI print. Ed Mills of Raymond James as shareholders vote on a takeover of U.S. Steel. And Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets as banks kick off that earnings season. Let's begin with our top story. U.S. stocks and treasuries looking to regain a bit of the losses for the week as investors push back uh, rate backs once again. Jonathan Reed Stubbs, uh, Jonathan Stubbs of Berenberg saying this. Initially, equity markets tracked interest rate expectations closely, but equities have continued to rally in the last couple of months as expectations of rate cuts have moderated. Some Fed members are now even suggesting just one rate cut later this year. Jonathan joins us now. And before we get into the will they or won't they cut rates debate, I want to get your sense on what you make over the price action, the fact that stocks have rebounded but entirely led by Mag Magnificent Seven with the rest of the complex left behind. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of sort of complicated dy dynamics, which I think are confusing. Uh, lots of us in markets, you know, we, we, you, the MAG 7 has been very strong in a leadership role in the US. But you look away from the US, just want to make, make this point that you look to Japan or Europe or the UK and value strategies have been, been leading. So growth and tech has been the dominant force in, uh, in the US and tech's done well in the rest of the world. But actually, you've done better running value. So you've got very sort of mixed signals coming from markets. The, the, the gap, as you mentioned, from the, the note we wrote between equity markets and rate expectations, there's a similar gap between gold and sort of real rates as well, which has emerged. So um, markets are sort of beating to multiple drums at the moment, and there's no consistency. I think that makes it very difficult for investors to really know how to position real time. Jonathan, good morning. It's Manus. Uh, the divergence was very, very prescient yesterday between the tonality of Christine Lagarde in terms of her ability, her desire to get on and cut rates. Look at the bond market this morning. Look at the euro at a five-month low. So these markets are reflective of a much more confident ECB in cutting mode relative to the U.S. What does that divergence story do to the equity story U.S. to Europe? Yeah, it's again, it's one of these contrasts that we're seeing this, this time you know, at the policy level, uh, also, you know, at an inflation level, and you know, you, you take a bit of a step back and think, you know, what's happening? This is what I call the the, the visible hand, the very visible hand of of the U.S. government. Um, if you look at you know, government investment in, in the U.S., it's running at sort of twelve percent year on year real. Um, that's that's twice as high as the the highest level we've seen in the last twenty years. Um, we, we know so U.S. government debt is sort of being added, you know, almost a a trillion dollars every every hundred days. So the U.S. government is sort of critical to an understanding and U.S. government policy and actions critical to understanding why the U.S. economy is being so re robust. In turn, why U.S. inflation is hotter. In turn, why U.S. rates will will be higher for longer. Uh, and, and Europe doesn't have such influence from that visible hand. So we're starting to see that gap emerge. Um, currency markets are reflecting that. In terms of what it means for, for equity markets, we're, you know, we're getting signals both from US equities and, and German equities, European equities, that after this very strong rally, um, investors shouldn't be chasing the market at this point. And, and that's pretty consistent across our signal set. So, so we, we think equity markets are set here for a consolidation phase or a, a pause for breath. Uh, and, and over the next few months, we have various risks that we have to digest as well. Some of them are political, some, some also geopolitical, as you've already mentioned. Listen, we've struggled to get a 2% drawdown in any one day in the United States in the past number of months. So if you talk about a pause, what invokes a significant pause? Is a significant pause a drawdown of more than 2%, down to 5%? Are you standing back and saying, look, there's not going to be a correction uh, to the scale of, of 10 percent? So what is it that invokes it? Is it no cuts at all? Is it that we suddenly end up there? I mean, we're down to one cut by some of the major houses. Or does U.S. exceptionalism mean equities can trade with impunity to no rate cuts? 
Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a it's a very good point. You know, we, you know, the, the whole Goldilocks trade was based on you know, U.S. avoiding recession, so soft landing. That seems likely, um, but you know, still risks there. And also, part of that was sort of quite sort of healthy support from moderating inflation and uh, significant rate cuts. And it seems that that's very unlikely now. So uh, markets have sort of turned a blind, blind eye to that. Uh, and I, I think the stretch in valuations we're seeing. Uh, you know, US is on 20 times forward, forward earnings. I, I always say we've only been higher than that twice in 50 years. That was the TMT bubble, liquidity fuel, that was the post-COVID bubble, liquidity fueled. You can argue now we have some version of that because we have a lot of liquidity crowding into US equity, into, in, into tech, into credit as well. Um, so we do have these sort of very powerful liquidity dynamics. But you know, as we go forward from here, I think at these levels, it's really important for investors to pursue what I call active hedging strategies. We have a high weight, 25% weight in our sort of asset allocation hedge, that's Bitcoin, gold and cash. Within equity markets, uh, we wrote a note a month ago on the energy sector. It's got valuation, cash flow, balance sheet, share buyback support, and you get a free hedge into geopolitics and also against the, the tech sector. So we're looking at active hedging strategies here. It's not a reason to run away completely from equity markets, but I think we have to sort of change how we, we sort of approach equity markets at these levels. What kind of drawdown are you looking for that would actually make it attractive? A 2% drawdown? Because it seems like we had, that would be something out of the norm of late. Yeah, I mean, to, 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 to genuinely trigger signals which are, you know, take on risk signals, then we're probably looking at a double digit drawdown for, for equities, US led. That's, that's sort of the, the magnitude of moves we need in these markets to, to get the various models that, that we look at, whether they're liquidity based, whether they're valuation based, whether they're sort of earnings margin driven. Um, we, we probably need a double digit return drawdown to, to then see some signaling which is supportive of taking on risk. So, you know, to, to, to get that, uh, we, we need a sort of uh, a, a bit of help from a risk being activated at this point. You, you mentioned uh, at the start of the show various sort of you know, active risks uh, in various parts of the world, including the Middle East. You know, th these are all risks that investors have got to uh, take on board right now. Um, but it, it, as you say, it, we, haven't se we haven't seen much of a drawdown in the US or in Europe remarkably over this sort of six month post October rally period is, is led to you know, our risk adjusted return analysis in Europe, for example, showing that in Germany we've had the highest risk adjusted returns on a six month rolling basis in the last 20 years. That's another signal which is telling us just to be more cautious at this, this point. So rebalance portfolios, actively hedge, don't disengage with equities, but make sure you're protected as well at the same time. Jonathan Stubbs of Berenberg, thank you so much. Uh, let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg brief. KKR is taking a cue from Berkshire Hathaway by bidding big on long term private equity and resulting dividends. In an exclusive interview, co-chief executive officer Joe Bay told me that company, the company expects to see $300 million of dividends in its strategic unit by 2026, with plans to double that by 2028. Berkshire Hathaway is an apt analogy in the sense that we look at a lot of business models, why certain firms have been super successful over time. And there are a lot of powerful messages in what Berkshire has built. It's the power of long-term ownership of assets, great businesses, the power of compounding, and the, the real power of smart capital allocation within your business. The Biden administration is ramping up its aggressive economic stance toward China. The Commerce Department adding six new Chinese companies to a blacklist on experts this week. That brings the total number of firms blacklisted by Biden to 319, the most of any U.S. administration topping the 306 that Donald Trump added while in office. Amazon joining the rest, hitting its first record since July 2021. The online retailer is the last of the five biggest U.S. tech firms to reach an all-time high in the rebound from the post-pandemic sell-off. In a bid to win over investors, Amazon has slashed costs and restructured its business. Its efforts to streamline its operations have helped boost profits and win over shareholders. Up next, Nippon's bid for U.S. Steel under scrutiny. My principal concern of those steelworker jobs and uh, this deal gives me great concern about the, the threat to those jobs. That's next. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance.
season is here. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. Continuing coverage on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Trying to finish the week with a little bit of quietness after a really volatile couple of days. We're seeing the stock market kind of retrace some of the gains that it saw yesterday. Uh, as we see the bond market as well trying to gain a little bit of momentum after a really brutal sell-off with some really bad auctions. Good morning. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. John Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and marie Hordern. John is off today. Manis Cranny is with us. And we are looking at a market that is reeling under a, a trifecta of different uh, influences. You have the Fed policy and ECB policy. You've got economic data. And you have geopolitics. Under surveillance this morning, Nippon's bid for U.S. Steel under scrutiny. We're pushing the White House on national security grounds and on trade enforcement um, and fundamentally what this means to American workers and American jobs. My principal concern are those steelworker jobs and uh, this deal gives me great concern about the, the threat to those jobs. Here's the latest. Shareholders of U.S. Steel voting today on the $14 billion sale to Nippon Steel. The vote coming as the Department of Justice opens an extended antitrust probe into the bid. Ed Mills of Raymond James writing, quote, Investor expectation is the shareholders will vote to approve the deal. The reality is that President Biden has committed to being the most pro-union president in the history of the United States. If the United Steel workers support it, it gets done. If they oppose it, it does not. Ed Mills joins us now. Ed, is basically the saga preparing to come to a close at the end of today when shareholders vote on this, you get steel workers that actually back this, and Joe Biden backs off. Well, you know, if you have the steel workers support this, um, I still think this is probably something that might need to go after the election for approval, um, because one of the first lessons I learned in D.C. is that when you're explaining you're losing, and so it's a very narrow window here uh, to get the support of the steel workers, but also not to have other Republicans, especially uh, the Republican nominee for the presidency, Donald Trump, to still blast the Biden administration. The two senators that you just highlighted are two of the most vulnerable senators come this fall, representing Ohio and Pennsylvania. If they lose, the Republicans will have a majority in the Senate. If Joe Biden loses Pennsylvania, he's not reelected. So there is a kind of clear political um, story here. Uh, what we're seeing in D.C. this week, kind of the, the bulls are telling me there's statements out of the U.S. ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, the former White House chief of staff, telling folks to chill. Um, that might be a signal that we just have to work out the politics. But there's also this continued insistence by a number of people, including the president, that U.S. Steel needs to remain a U.S. domiciled company. And so that's where I kind of really highlight how important it is uh, for the workers to come on board and get some labor commitments before this deal would politically be able to close. Sounds like they have to run out the clock if they want to see this deal get closed. You mentioned Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown. Well, the other Ohio senator, the Republican, J.D. Vance, also potential VP pick for Donald Trump, is writing this letter overnight, we've learned from political, to U.S. Steel, about U.S. Steel and the Securities and Exchange Commission, concerned about the company's misleading shareholders in a March proxy statement. So you see this on both sides of the political aisle. So if you look at the future, doing deals in the United States, how difficult is it going to be, whether or not it is Biden or Trump, next year? Amory. We have populism in our politics, um, and when we have that and we have the income inequality that exists in this country, the technological changes, that usually sees a significant increase in antitrust scrutiny. Um, I think that continues regardless of who is president. Um, some of the personnel will change. Some of the incentives will change. I do think the Nippon U.S. Steel deal is unique in terms of the fact that this is kind of an iconic uh, name, 
that this brings about some economic anxieties that have existed uh, within the uh, kind of Midwest for years. Um, there is kind of the trade fight that we have with China, but before the trade fight we had with China um, in the 80s and 90s, those trade fights were with Japan. Um, so it comes at a politically very difficult time where this might just be kind of wrong company at the wrong time. Um, we have to see if that works out uh, with the deal with the steel workers. It is also very unfortunate for them to kind of have this vote two days after the Japanese prime minister had a White House state dinner, was before Congress. So it's, it's more about the unique aspects of this deal um, for this company, but it is in that broader kind of populist kind of antitrust, anti-M&A kind of environment that exists here in D.C. Ed, we've also got a number of developments overnight regarding the Middle East. One about how the U.S. Embassy in Israel, they're telling personnel not to travel outside of places like Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. Late last night, we heard from uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry that there was a call between Secretary Blinken and his counterpart regarding the Middle East. There's a lot of concerns that there is going to be this retaliation from Iran. What is the U.S. response going to be to that? So since October 7th, the United States government and the Biden administration has been trying to contain um, the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Uh, this is the biggest challenge since October 7th, especially after the uh, Israeli attack on the Syrian um, kind of consulate in of Iran. Iran is going to want to have a response here. Uh, what that response is um, really is going to be a question of does it kind of just respond to that previous attack, or is it a precursor for a broadening out of this conflict? That's what investors want to know. Um, in DC, um, what we're looking at here is kind of how much does that impact kind of energy prices? How much does that impact inflation? Um, how much does the kind of broadening out kind of make it even more difficult for Biden to discuss kind of how he has led kind of the geopolitical side of his job. And so the more there is geopolitical risk, the more that there is inflation, the harder that is politically uh, for Biden, the more there's inflation, the more there's geopolitical risk, the harder it is for this market to grind higher. Uh, so this is both a international and domestic story, but also very much a DC in market story. Ed, good morning, Manus. How important is it that the escalation is in the form of proxies, either in the Houthis or in Hezbollah, in other words, around the, ge ge the geography of Israel and not in the Persian Gulf. We have the Iran's Revolutionary Guard saying it won't block the Hormuz Strait. Now, this is critically important because this is where there's an inflection point on oil and energy prices. So what is the tolerable, acceptable response, do you think, for the U.S. in terms of the proxies? Yeah, Manis, I would think that from an investor perspective, from a kind of leadership perspective, uh, if it is a response through the proxies, I think that would be viewed as arguably the best case scenario because we are already seeing kind of the proxies of Hezbollah and Houthis already engaged in the region. And so how much of it is just a dialing up for Iran to remind the world that they still have the power and they need to have a direct and specific response uh, to the attack? Um, so I think that would be kind of viewed from the market as the least disruptive. Um, if you saw something that was directly from Iran, that's where we'd have the biggest question marks for this market and for the fact that it could be broadening out. So I think, Manish, you hit on the, the exact issue uh, we, we have been debating with clients. Ed Mills of Raymond James, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And as you do debate this and the market debates this, you see oil prices crude now up 1.1 percent and just really crossing that $90 threshold once again. And Marie, I am struck by the idea that this is going to be escalation regardless, because if, if Iran uh, directs Houthis to attack Israel, then it just sort of solidifies the connection between the two. There will be a response. When is the question? And what we also heard from Axios overnight is that the Iranian foreign minister, uh, Amir Hossein Abdullian, told his German counterpart that it will be, quote, appropriate. I don't think Iran wants to start a war, but when their consulate is attacked, this is a government building, they know they have to respond. Tit for tat without necessarily creating a global uh, conflagration. Coming up, Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets with earnings from JP Morgan and Wells Fargo around the corner. You do see markets taking a bit of a dip after yesterday's reprieve uh, that was led by the Magnificent Seven.
Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance uh, with Jonathan Farrell, Anne-Marie Hedard, and Lisa Abramowitz. John out, Manis Cranny in. Right now, we are looking at a little bit of a take back after yesterday's reprieve in the uh, stock market in particular. It was led by the big tech stocks right now. A little bit of a dip, no drama. Two-tenths of a percent decline on the S&P, 52.35. If we'd been talking about 52.35 at the end of last year, people would have said, yeah, you're crazy. Uh, what you can see, though, is the underperformance is coming from the NASDAQ. This really is the question. How long can the Magnificent Seven really uh, keep generating the gains at a time when it turns to the bond market. And this is really the question. And Manis Crane, I'd love you to weigh in. As bond yields reach past a certain level, when does that threaten Magnificent Seven, which at one point were thought to be the most interest rate sensitive stocks? I think you're going to have a litany of analysts who will come in here and they will talk to you about the strength of balance sheets. Then they will go on to say to you about the cash piles on the various Mag 7 balance sheets that are sitting in money market funds that are earning over 5% on a constant basis, which balances them out against the cost of interest on anything that they've got to do. I mean, honestly, this is amazing. I could get a new job, couldn't I? <laughs> well, but this is really the issue: is that they're actually uh, making bank with but their cash. But they are cash. resilient. They are. Uh, they're absolutely resilient. And tech and AI are an evolving and ever evolving. And I think the pace of ev evolution in AI is something that we are going to really drill into over the next year. It's a complicated picture with a lot of diverging narratives, and one that's really mm. kind of thrown a wrench into the works or maybe fueled some bets has been what's going on in the commodity space. And Emory, you know, we keep saying, is this something that's going to extend the cycle or curtail it? When it comes to oil, it depends on the why. But it's not just oil, and we were talking about the risks in the Middle East, but it's oil, it's copper, gold hitting a new all-time high. Are they all being influenced by the same potential risk-off feel from the Middle East uh, crisis, or is this something else in sort of uh, this mis mishmash of narratives that we have? Broadly speaking, when you look at some of the hard commodities, it's about a global manufacturing revamp, especially when it comes to likes of potentially in China. But also copper is because of potential uh, these copper cuts at Chinese smelters because how much China matters to the copper market. When it comes to oil, though, the question analysts continue to ask is, is this temporary or not? And if you look at some of the calls, when they say that oil potentially reached 95 dollars $100 a barrel, people are looking at the summer and then potentially it fades away. But that's where it's a political poison here. It, it, driving season is coming, gas at $4 a gallon. As you go towards the main messaging in the election, that's gonna be the critically important thing. But don't forget that you've got OPEC Plus and their ability, and this is something we need to keep in the back of our minds, which is the ability to switch on the taps very quickly. Uh, Saudis down at 9 million barrels, the Emiratis have excess capacity, the Saudis have excess capacity. So if OPEC Plus really do want to help out their friends in the White House, I don't know whether that's the kind of alliance they have. Yeah, I have two oil experts on my on the show this morning, so uh, we will be getting lots of this. This is actually really pertinent relative to the recent price action. A lot of it will be determined when you talk about politics also by where yields yeah. are and what that means for Fed policy. Under surveillance this morning, Fed President Susan Collins urging patience before easing can begin, saying, quote, the recent data have not materially changed my outlook, but they do highlight uncertainties related to timing. This also implies that less easing of policy than previously thought may be warranted. Bloomberg's Michael McKee will be speaking with President Collins later this morning at 9 a.m. But, Manis, it strikes me that this was exactly what people were looking for. How much does uh, a hot CPI print really change the narrative for a Federal Reserve that has seemed really gung-ho about cutting no matter what? This comes down to one word, confidence, and I think it was reflected very clearly yesterday. There's a spread. There's a divergence we know in rates. There's a divergence in currency. There's a divergence in confidence between the Fed's confidence to actually get on that cutting track. You've got a number of houses now down to one and done in December. So that is late and less, certainly less than the market had anticipated. Whereas listen to the narrative from Christine Lagarde, and it was emphatic. I mean, that lady took a hold of that news conference right at the end, and she said, our disinflation is different to their disinflation. Um, perhaps I'm over-egging the tone, but it was very, very clear <laughs> at the end. Why not? Have a bit of drama on a Friday. <laughs> Marie. Well, we also heard from Thomas Barkin yesterday, the Richmond Fed president, and he was talking about if you want to recalibrate, when does inflation start to make that case? And he said this, unfortunately, the last three months have not been supportive of the case, but we'll see. Remember Priya Misra is bumpy, the new transitory? Last three months, three times, Mm, is that a blip? Is that a bump? Or is that now going to be a trend? And I think that's what we want from Susan Collins today. They don't seem to be ready to wholeheartedly just yeah. sort of abandon the theory that just normalizing policy does mean bringing rates down and that it is needed at some point later today. Meanwhile, Apple looking to boost computer sales with a new line of Macs featuring in-house processors designed 
for guess what? Artificial intelligence. Bloomberg is reporting every Mac model will be updated after sales fell 27% in the last fiscal year. Apple climbing over 4% yesterday, the biggest single day gain in 11 months, which maybe fueled some of the gains. But Anne-Marie, this raises a question, is this signaling or is this something that is actually going to fuel sales, considering that it's not the Max that's really going to drive anything? It's just the suggestion of, what was that? AI. Yeah, they're weaving AI now into products, unlike potentially weaving AI into fancy new products like the robot we've been talking about and that Mark Gurman also was scooping. But the problem with Apple is that they're playing catch up to Microsoft, to Google when it comes to AI. But potentially the end of the year, we'll see something actually tangible because AI may now be integrate into your computers. You don't need to go find it on a website. Your phone will talk to you and it will cook dinner for you and it will tell you why you are parenting incorrectly. Meanwhile, bank earnings. Morgan Stanley share is falling the most in five months after a report that multiple regulators are investigating the bank's wealth unit. The Wall Street Journal reporting the SEC, the Office of the Comptroller and Currency and the Treasury all digging into whether or not the bank has done enough to identify risky clients and the potential for money laundering. The news comes at sort of inauspicious timing when it comes to just where banks are in the focus. JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and Citi are set to report earnings this morning. Morgan Stanley on deck next week. Gerard Cassidy of RBC joining us right now. Gerard, before we get to JP Morgan, which uh, does come out probably in about 10 minutes time, how seriously are you taking this report about Morgan Stanley? It's very seriously, sir. You know, AML, BSA issues, as we all know, are very, very serious for all financial institutions. And you have to imagine that Morgan Stanley obviously is working very diligently with the regulators to solve this problem. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, this has happened, but I think they'll resolve the problem and over time they'll, they'll fix this issue. Meanwhile, J.P. Morgan on deck, and I do want to get to that because a lot of people used to herald this as the beginning of earnings season and really the kickoff to the tone that we can expect from other companies. Increasingly, it has not served as that, but it has sh uh, shown to be a litmus test for bank earnings. What are you looking for? What's most important in this report? I, I think, Lisa, the two most important parts of the reports that we're expecting today from J.P. Morgan and its peers is, number one, net interest income growth. As you know, this is driven by the interest rate environment, and the interest rate environment today is quite a bit different than January when they gave their guidance on $90 billion of net interest income in 2024. They were expecting six Federal Reserve Fed Fund rate cuts. Now today, as you guys have pointed out on the show, there's an expectation of zero to two. So we anticipate that they will up their guidance on that net interest income because with six cuts, they were expecting their net interest income to be less than where they were last year. The second most important part is credit. What is credit quality doing for them and their peers? We're all very familiar with what's going on in the office markets in the United States. So we need to see is credit holding up in the other areas? And then third, capital markets. How strong was their capital markets business this quarter? Joe, good morning, Manus. I mean, the other, if you take our mind back one year ago, we were dealing with a regional bank crisis. JP Morgan stepped in, did the honorable thing and, and sort of saved the literally saved the system. First Republic, at the time, they said it was going to be generating around $500 million. That has literally been increased a number of times in terms of what the market thinks that's going to be worth. Up to $2 billion. How important is First Republic in the numbers? And does that story run out of breath at some stage? Manage, you bring up a very good point because they did initially guide to about a $500 million of annual net earnings from that first Republic transaction. And then in their shareholder letter, Jimmy Dimon pointed out that now they anticipate about two billion, significantly higher. And I think what it shows you is that they were being very conservative going into that weekend when they took over First Republic. And I think on top of that, they've discovered that the quality of the people, the quality of the business was better than expected. And the people themselves are, I think, embracing the JP Morgan culture, which is helping that number. But I think as you go forward, it is an important part of the business. Obviously, this company is an enormous company, and this will be helpful. It's not obviously the primary driver of the business, but whenever you can pick up $2 billion of net income, that's very positive for the institution.
It, it'll be well taken by, by, by anybody, that kind of number. Uh, Jared, look, we've had a, a roaring start to 2024, and then it feels as if that exuberance, I had the global head of HSBC with me just a couple of weeks ago talking about that initial real run hard in, in corporate investment banking, DCM, ECM, but it seems as if that possibly hit a bit of a wall. How important is it that they guide forward that IPO, DCM, E? You know, equity capital markets are continuing with the strength that we saw at the start of the year. How important is that for 2024? It's an interesting observation because the first quarter of the year is always the strong quarter for investment banking, particularly DCM that you've identified. And I would say that the guidance that we're all expecting is seasonally it's going to slow slow down. And you're really going to look at it on a year over year basis. And as you know, in the first quarter of this year, most of the banks are expected to report investment banking results that are plus anywhere from, let's call it 10 to 11 percent to plus 18 percent year over year growth. So we anticipate that we'll hear more positive you know, guidance on this air in this area because the Capital markets are still resilient. Yes, there's numerous geopolitical risks out there, but unless the markets really collapse, which we don't expect, we expect to see a decent investment banking year. But again, it is seasonal. So sequentially, second quarter generally is lower than first quarter, but 2Q24 two, two over 2Q23 will be the critical number. I'd love to ask you about Wells Fargo because they have a big loan book tied to real estate. How concerned are you about that loan book and the health of the U.S. real estate market? Anne-Marie, it's interesting because commercial real estate at the biggest banks today is very manageable. You know, you turn back the clock to 1990, and when you look at the exposures the banking industry had to office commercial real estate, it was devastating, and it was significantly higher than what we're seeing today. But Wells Fargo, you know, they have in total commercial real estate loans to total loans, it's just under 10%. And they have identified their office portfolio, which is, I believe, around 2 to 3% of the total loans. And they've already set aside around 11% of that portfolio in what we refer to as loan loss reserves. So we're not denying, no one's denying that the banks are going to have some issues in commercial office space. But the key is it's manageable. They have so many other revenue drivers that though they're going to take some losses, they're going to be able to handle those losses. Where in 1990, the losses were so significant, no one could handle them, and it caused a number of bank failures. So it's manageable, and we think that uh, we'll hear more about that today on their call. Gerard, as you're speaking, we're getting news uh, coming out of Reuters that uh, Susan Collins of the Boston Federal Reserve is eyeing about two rate cuts this year. This kind of just feeds into this idea that we're in a higher for longer type of environment, which you kind of led off with in terms of how much that's going to deliver to banks. Are you saying that at this point, given how much the rate structure is already adjusted, all the big banks are only going to benefit from higher from longer rather than have that be a detraction from some of their portfolios? Uh, Lisa, I think you're right. Um, I think what you're going to find is that higher for longer is going to be generally better for most, if not nearly all, the big banks. And the re reason being is this. The cost of funding, the cost of deposits is starting to stabilize. If you go back to the last four tightening cycles, what you'll find is that around six to nine months following the last Fed funds rate increase, which was in July of last year, deposit costs start to stabilize. Deposit beta is stabilized. However, the cash flow is coming off of the assets, fixed income securities as well as loans. They get reinvested into higher yielding securities. So the spreads start to widen. So higher for longer is beneficial to the banks. Now, granted, uh, one or two cuts would even be better because funding costs would start to fall. But generally, higher for longer, we would argue, is better. And you just compare that to what happened going into 2020 at the start of the pandemic when they cut rates dramatically. And that was very negative for margins. And obviously, we're not expecting that today. But Gerard, a boom for bigger banks, but higher rates cause a lot of pain for regional banks, what's the divergence you see now from the big and small when you look across the U.S. landscape? I guess that we, we really have to look at the size of the regional banks because when you think about the regional banks, they tend to generate more uh, net interest income than they have in fee revenues vis-a-vis -vis the big banks. 
And so the benefits I think you're going to find for the regional banks is that their funding costs will also stabilize. And as long as you don't see any rapid increases in deposit costs, and again, we don't expect that, there'll be some continued bleeding into what we call the non-interest bearing going into interest bearing deposits. But the uh, regionals are going to see the same benefit of their cash flows. There's a bank in Puerto Rico called Popular, and it's a regional bank. Obviously, it's in Puerto Rico, not in the mainland. And they have some of the best guidance on net interest income growth because of this phenomenon of stable deposit rates and reinvesting into higher yielding assets. Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets, please stick with us. We are waiting those JP Morgan earnings crossing any minute now. Right now, let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hakes. Yahira. Hi, Lisa. Kathy Wood's ARK Investment Management announcing it holds a stake in OpenAI. It's the latest in a string of high-profile investments into the Silicon Valley darling, the biggest coming from Microsoft investing $13 billion. This comes as Kathy Wood's most famous vehicle, the ARK Innovation ETF, has been struggling. After years of gains, it stumbled this year due to a decline in Tesla stock performance. EU regulators finding that weight loss drug Wagovi does not pose increased suicide risks. The European Medicines Agency adding that its review found similar results for Novo Nordisk's other blockbuster diabetes drug, Ozempic. Regulators also studied weight loss drugs from competitors Eli Lilly and AstraZeneca. No link was found for those drugs either. After more than a decade of negotiations, New York City is getting its first soccer stadium. New York City FC has been given approval for a 25,000-seat, $780 million stadium in Queens near City Field. It's, prod- it's part of a broader development in the area that will also include 2,500 affordable homes, a hotel, and more than 20,000 square feet of retail space. Mayor Ed- Eric Adams says the development will generate about $6 billion for the city over 30 years. The stadium is set to open in 2027. That's your Bloomberg Brief. Lisa? Thank you so much, Yahira. We are getting uh, some Wells Fargo earnings crossing early before J.P. Morgan. We are seeing net interest income below expectations, $12.23 billion versus the estimate of $12.32 billion. We are seeing that their revenue came in above expectations of $20.9 billion versus the estimate of 20.2. But really, people are looking at the net interest margin, 2.81% versus 2.84%. Uh, as expected. We'll dive through all of those numbers as well as get a sense of what's going on with J.P. Morgan right now. The initial read from stock investors are uh, that it is a negative kind of issue. We are just also getting uh, first quarter earnings uh, from J.P. Morgan. Just to give you a little flavor of it, we did get a sense uh, that they are beating, although on their first quarter loans, a little bit lower than expectation. We'll break it all down uh, and get you a sense of what we're looking for here. But they are trickling in as we get a sense of the biggest wall Street banks. Right now, we're looking at managed interest, net interest, actually coming in slightly below uh, expectations, $23.2 billion versus $23.22 billion, basically in line. But across the book, what you're seeing is adjusted revenue for the first quarter, $42.55 billion versus the estimate of $41.64 billion, likely another record in terms of their <laughs> revenue coming in the bank. The shares are up about three-tenths of a percent. We'll break that all down coming up and more. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. We are getting the bank earnings that were promised. Wells Fargo came out and it did uh, miss expectations just slightly when it comes to net interest income. When you look at J.P. Morgan right now, beating a pretty much across the board when it comes to revenues, a little bit less when you dig under the hood. Shanali Basak joining us now of Bloomberg. You are going to be much wiser on this than I am. What are you looking at? Well, I'm going to make my way through the supplement in a moment to see what the guidance is for J.P. Morgan. But on the surface, they certainly did beat expectations. And as you've been talking about, about the important thing about this is rate cuts are expected to be a lot less, meaning JP Morgan would 
benefit a lot more. Now, equity sales and trading revenue came in above expectations, and so did fixed income sales and trading. So JP Morgan really putting their balance sheet to work here and making markets in a volatile market. It's what Wall Street wants to see. And of course, you have investment banking fees also up uh, just above expectations here. So JP Morgan just clipping those fees as Wall Street starts to come back in those traditional businesses. Now, we'll look under the hood here, but on the first blush, you also see credit quality coming in a bit better than expected. Now, does that hold? While we look forward to Jamie Dimon's commentary here, we'll see how he feels about it as we wait for the call a little later today. We also want to see what he says about capital return, because the picture now is going to be looking past that summer of stress tests and seeing how much JP Morgan is going to put back to work for investors. Chanel, stay tight. Please uh, take some time to look through the supplement. Gerard Cassidy is still with us of RBC Capital. Marcus Gerard, you've had some, uh, some minutes <laughs> to be looking through this. What stands out? Uh, Lisa, what was interesting, what, what Chanel just said about credit, I'm just looking at the release here, and their credit costs in the quarter were $1.9 billion, um, which included what they call $2.0 billion in net charge-offs. Uh, our number, and we were close to the street, our cost of credit was close to 2.8. But it, this is the important part. Last year, many of the banks built up reserves in anticipation of a recession. And we're not obviously having a recession. So I expect across the board for more banks to release reserves, which is what J.P. Morgan did. So from the credit picture, I, we view that quite positive. Um, second, on the revenue side, as you guys have pointed out, mm -hmm. the numbers came in nice, uh, slightly better than expected, particularly in the capital markets area. Jared, I was just looking at additional headlines. This is on net interest income, which we've all been talking about this morning. The expectation was for perhaps a guide higher, but he talks about the current quarter. NII fell on deposit margin compression on lower deposits. Again, higher for longer. Maybe you look at money market funds. Maybe you switch out some of your deposits. But this is perhaps part of the narrative as to why the stock is down 3% pre-market. So the first blush, to use that phrase, is NII deposit margin compression. This is not what the street wants to hear. They wanted an uplift. Yeah, they still see, by the way, there's a red headline just come through. They do expect net interest income of about 90 billion. The market wanted a wee bit more than that. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Uh, people were hoping for 92, uh, but it's the first quarter of the year. So obviously, they want, I think most banks want to be a little more conservative. But this is the key point. The first half of this year, we are expecting from most of the banks to see a, a, an inflection on net interest income. It may not come in the first quarter, but there certainly is likely to be an inflection, again, assuming the Fed does not uh, aggressively cut rates, or for that matter, the, the more bear case to me is that the Fed actually raises rates, and nobody's expecting that, of course, right now. So the point is that the net interest income numbers Certainly, the margins were, came under a little pressure from both banks, um, Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan. And the real key now going forward is growing the balance sheet to par partially offset some of that pressure. Janali, you've been reading through the supplement. Anything at stand out? Importantly, not only is net interest income standing still in terms of the guidance for the year, you actually have an upward adjustment for their expected full year expenses. I think that it is an extraordinary, extraordinarily important figure here to raise it by about a billion dollars because if JP Morgan is spending a billion more, then what is the ripple effect across everybody else? The inflation effect for these banks is super important, especially because JP Morgan has had a discipline to grow headcount and keep a ability here to invest while other banks have really struggled with that efficiency ratio. So I'm really curious about kind of the broader read here on how much more the story will turn from that interest rate story to the inflation story and how much of that is going to eat away at the margins. Gerard, this wasn't what you expected. You thought that actually higher for longer would benefit banks. How surprised are you at some of this guidance? Yep. The the higher for longer is really for the second, third, and fourth quarters. So, we, so far, the numbers are in line with expectations. But the $90 billion, it would have been nice to see that uh, pushed up a bit. But, again, it's the first quarter, and we got three quarters to go. And I think it's still going to be a, a good year for this, this company as well as 
some of the other banks. Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets, thank you so much, as always, for being with us. Bloomberg Shanali Basik, thank you. We will be hearing more from you throughout the morning. Coming up next, we do have Ken Leon of CFRA, Linda Dussel of Federated Hermes, and Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence, as well as Colin Martin of Charles Schwab. I have to say, as I parse through some of this uh, data, Emory, I'm struck by the fact that J.P. Morgan is still minting money, but expectations have been so high based on how out much this stock has outperformed. That's right. Expectations are basically almost too high for them to meet. Market wanted a lot more when it comes to the net income interest. I was struck by what Shanali said in terms of efficiency. This is what Mohammed El Arian said Tuesday. Don't look at aggregate data when it comes to inflation. What are the earnings calls telling you? And what Shanali is saying is the earning calls are telling you inflation is hitting business. Two key things here are the provisions. Provisions at Wells Fargo for what for credit losses significantly lower than what the market had anticipated. At 938, we're looking for one and a quarter billion. Credit loss provision here also significantly lower. That tells you go America exceptionalism. All right, well, we'll have more on that coming up. Right now, looking forward, we don't see any rate cuts. I think you're okay and you will have some rate cuts, but it will not be probably what people expected. We're still holding on to that June call. I think it's a very close call at this point. I think people need to have more clarity on how long it's going to take to cut. It's a very binary market. When you're on hold and you're, you're data dependent, both the markets and the Fed, you know, it's going to cause you know, these sort of, sort of reactions, in my opinion. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. This week might have started boring. It is anything but right now. We had CPI on Wednesday, PPI yesterday, bank earnings coming out now with a really interesting read across the street. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Television. And Marie Hordern, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz. John is off today. Man is cranny in the hot seat. We have just gotten bank earnings. We're going to get into it uh, significantly with J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. But before we do, I do want to just sort of set the steam because it has been, man, as a tumultuous week in terms of price action. Wednesday, pretty massive of sell-off and then a recalibration since that has left maybe more questions than answers. It's been the slow dissipation of a belief that the Federal Reserve has got the ability to cut. Bump, bump, bump. Three bumps in the road in regards to data really, really changed the narrative in the U.S. It should be said that bonds are rallying in the U.S. this morning. Likewise in Germany, a monster move in Germany because we have this divergence at play in currencies, in rates, and in equities as well. And it is manifest this morning as we see the bond market fly higher than the Treasury market in the U.S. Jonathan Stubbs of Berenberg actually put it well this morning when he said there's so many different narratives that are kind of driving different actions that it's very difficult to come up with any cohesive storyline, which is why we're all struggling. But, you know, we talk about whether Treasuries are a haven bid. And, and Marie, it goes to this question, how much are we seeing the bleed through from what's happening in oil prices in the rest of the commodity complex in the heels of the Middle East uh, conflagration? Is there a sense that that's driving haven bids and that Treasuries may or may not be part of that. Well, potentially, but what's the haven bid? Because we've also seen gold continuously hit record after record. People are actually starting to park some more of their money, maybe not treasuries, and maybe yeah. saying, actually, I want something hard like gold. Commodities, though, you always have to ask, is this temporary? You look, you look across the board, it's green on the screen from base metals, precious metals, and oil. Oil will be in focus today because of all the rhetoric overnight and this idea that Israel is going to be bracing for retaliation from Iran. All right, let's get the scores. We do have, uh, as Manis was saying, a bit of a rally in the bond market. Yields lower by about five basis points, which is interesting how much that's really retracing some of the moves that we've seen previously. 452.97 on the 10-year. S&P futures actually extending the losses that we saw earlier down four tenths of a percent after we got those bank earnings. Euro 106.49, the weakness protracted as we get the sense that the East CB is poised to cut before the Fed, most likely in June, 89 percent chance right now being priced into the market and oil, as we were mentioning, up one and a quarter percent. Let's take a look at those banks because we did get J.P. Morgan. We did get Wells Fargo City up next. And what we are seeing is pretty much right across the board. Uh, there is a sense that this is a disappointment, that they were not able to jump a hurdle. And there is sort of this hint of further competition that is eroding uh, some of their previous joyride. 3.5 percent decline on J.P. Morgan shares. Wells Fargo down 1.7 percent. City in anticipation 
participation down eight tenths of a percent. And I would love to get a sense of uh, what exactly is going on beneath the hood. Shanali Basak is still with us of Bloomberg, um, parsing through some of the information. What stands out as part of what's driving this overall negative narrative? There are a couple things going on. One is the fact that J.P. Morgan didn't raise the bar. Remember, coming into this earnings cycle, J.P. Morgan was trading at 1.9 times book value nearly. So way more expensive than any other bank and a 14 percent rise in its shares until this point. Now they are saying that they are not raising necessarily their net interest income guidance, but they did, according to the presentations quarter over quarter, raise their guidance for expenses for the full year. So there will be questions on how to think about that. Another thing that's important is why net interest income may not rise this year, even if we see lower rate cuts. J.P. Morgan is the king in the room when it comes to the credit card businesses, right? And so we know that credit card balances in the United States have risen well past a trillion dollars. And now there are questions starting to rise about how much you can max out the American consumer, right? You have to wonder whether there is juice left to squeeze in these consumer lending businesses that have just minted money for these big banks. Line from UBS comes to mind, never underestimate the hedonism of the U.S. consumer. I'll just, I'll just put that to you. But um, Jamie Dimon on the MLive blog, he's talking about this. Um, there's a number of large persistent inflationary pressures. So even talking to the macro, if we step back and talk for the macro picture, uh, again, they're seeing inflationary pressures. That's going to hit their expense line. And that's important as well. It certainly is. And remember, for J.P. Morgan, they can navigate it. They have the best returns on equity of anybody on Wall Street by a margin, by a large margin. But if you think about that read through for the rest of the banking system, how painful that could be. And you also think about, you know, how much can some of these other businesses jump back to support that increased cost? One lucky thing is Wall Street is jumping back. You have finally investment banking coming back to support those trading businesses. But again, a question remains, man, is how hard do you have to work? Not only how much do you have to spend when it comes to that extra banker fee, that extra trader fee. Guaranteed bonuses. Exactly. But also this idea when you look at the way that they're using their own yeah. balance sheet, J.P. Morgan's value at risk has risen just a tick higher than it's been throughout the last year, which means that they're having to work a little harder to put that risk appetite back into markets. You see that most, they go line by line back in foreign exchange and credit products as you would expect where the volatility is. Which raises this question about how much the Apollos of the world and the KKRs and the Oak Trees and the uh, Carlisles are really starting to eat away at some of their ability to just sit back and take it easy. Chanel, I stay close. We've got Wells Fargo coming up in a little less than an hour. Ken Leon, Director of Equity Research at CFRA, joins us now. Ken, what's your big takeaway from the earnings reports we've gotten so far? I, you know, I think the first quarter sets the base for growth for the rest of this year. And I think the narrative is to be conservative. Uh, we certainly have a different economic backdrop is for growth. Uh, we saw a very healthy loan activity that will accelerate for the rest of the year, not only consumer, but really business. And to your point about are the banks going to compete with the Apollos of the world we saw healthy fixed income underwriting. We also saw off the shelf dusting uh, bank loan syndicates and giving very aggressive pricing. So the direct lending from the Apollos and Aries um, is really bought off. So I think the opportunity here is really net interest income is based on rate, but also on volume. Volume is business activity, expanding the balance sheet, and that's why I think J.P. Morgan is guiding conservatively and they're going to exceed expectations if we have a very healthy U.S. economy this year, which we believe. Good morning, Ken. I'm looking at both Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan on the provision for credit losses. And just before the break, as we went to the break, I said $1.88 billion at J.P. Morgan, uh, less than a billion over at Wells Fargo. Still, both of these materially lower than the market had expected. And that talks to the uniqueness and the strength of the U.S. economy. It, it does. And the narrative's different than January, where there was more concern of recession and also areas that where we could see higher credit risk. So as to my point, as you see the volumes of a healthy U.S. economy, you will see some increases in loan provisions but it's going to be proportional and it will stay in the normalized area. So I, I, I don't think credit risk is a problem, but uh, both bank managements and analysts, you know, we'd like to look at it and talk about it. Well, obviously, dividend and buybacks are, are part of the narrative with banks. We'll hear a little bit more 
hopefully later on today from, from Jamie Dimon on that front. As you look at the banks, we've had this pivot to breadth in financials generally, but where are the le- where's the leadership in the dividend story, Ken, for you? It's a great question. And now we're speaking about investors in terms of uh, when we look at the financial sector, 65% are 12 stocks, six of the largest banks are in there. And also return of capital comes up with the uh, mid-year, the June uh, bank stress test. Um, and you know we think the banks are very well capitalized. They're also uh, re- building, re- building up their capital because we don't know what's going to happen with what's called Basel III end game, uh, which is getting a lot of pushback from Congress that it's too onerous and has negative inf- impact for the U.S. economy. So I think what we have here, and uh, CFRA went to an overweight on the financial sector, and the large banks are part of that story, is because we're going to see very healthy return of capital. Um, And probably we're going to get a glimpse of that uh, at the end of June. Ken, you know, sometimes people take a look at bank earnings and they say it kicks off the rest of earnings season because it gives a tone of what the economic outlook uh, looks like. I'm not clear on whether there is a clear read on the economy going forward in these earnings. Did you get one? I think there is because we did see uh, credit service income still very healthy year over year and sequential. So the consumer is healthy and spending. We'll take a closer look at uh, volumes or transaction activity. Uh, we did see um, in the commercial loan activity, mid-team uh, growth year over year for J.P. Morgan. Uh, that suggests that we're seeing CEOs more confident for capital raising, uh, whether it be through loan activity or going to the capital markets, which we think in the second half of this year, there is a tsunami of capital that has to exit the private equity firms, which is going to benefit IPOs or m and Meanwhile, what you're looking at in terms of net interest compression, that is compelling to me. And Menis was talking about this earlier, this idea that they've got to pay more for deposits and that deposits are leaving. This really raises a question. Is this basically you're going to get a more direct read through of that 5 percent benchmark rate if you just get into a savings account? And this might be somewhat personal. But, you know, there's this question of are they going to have to pay up akin to what the regional banks have having having had to do for a longer period of time? Totally different businesses. It's an easy narrative. So, so I mean, if you're City or J.P. Morgan, you have Treasury Services, custodial institution, and then of course you have small business and individuals. So, their re- their relationships are far greater than giving five percent versus you know, of a small bank versus four point six percent on a CD. Um, their relationships are dynamic, and when you look across where deposits are for these large banks. And, and there is a, a high percentage to my description that are non-interest bearing, that it, it's a little bit different. So um, Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America, always has a great explanation for this is we have diversified businesses. And in terms of our deposit base, it's also based on the underpinnings of other things that we do in those relationships. Well, JP Morgan certainly has that breadth. Um, Give me your view on this. If I reflect back to the start of the year, HSBC um, wholesale sacked 27% of the commercial real estate exposure. They were nervous. The world was nervous. We're less nervous now. It takes my mind back to just before the GFC. Who was left holding the baby when it came to, you know, CDSs? Who is holding the baby in terms of C or E exposure that we should be concerned about? Or is that a media obsession and not an analyst's obsession with C or E? We look very closely at that. And I also cover part of real estate. And there isn't a black spawn event here for the largest banks. Uh, But when you go down and look at the total portfolio of commercial real estate, it's mostly in multifamily. Um, And then when we go down to office, Uh, For J.P. Morgan, it's investment grade borrowers, it's class A tower buildings. It might be idiosyncratic, but um, to Gerard's point, Gerard Cassidy earlier, you know, it's under 5 percent, 3 percent of of the total loans. Um, When you get down to the regional banks or smaller, it becomes more problematic. But because these are not massive consumer loans, uh, they'll just kind of uh, extend these loans for two or three years and work out any problem real estate. But for the largest banks, uh, we all watch it very closely um, and we look at all the metrics 
and, and think that this will be more idiosyncratic, not systemic. Ken Lian of CFRA, you are going to be back with us in 8 a.m. following the Citigroup earnings. Thank you so much for being with us today. Right now, let's get to an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hakis. Yahira. Hi, Lisa. Morgan Stanley shares falling the most in five months after a report that a number of U.S. regulators are investigating the bank's wealth unit. The Wall Street Journal reporting the SEC, the Office of the Controller of the Currency, and the Treasury are all digging into whether or not the bank has done enough to identify risky clients and the potential for money laundering. Kathy Wood's ARK Investment Management announcing it holds a stake in OpenAI. It's the latest in a string of high-profile investments into the Silicon Valley darling, the biggest coming from Microsoft, investing $13 billion. This comes as Kathy Wood's most famous vehicle, the ARK Innovation ETF, has been struggling. After years of gains, it stumbled this year due to a decline in Tesla's stock performance. And President Joe Biden making another move to tackle student debt. He's forgiving loans for about 277,000 Americans, most of them enrolled in the government's SAVE program, which promises to cancel debt after at least 10 years of repayments. This move will wipe away about $7.4 billion in federal student debt. Earlier this week, President Biden announced a plan B to forgive loans for more than 25 million borrowers. That move is likely to face court challenges. That's your Bloomberg Brief. Lisa? Thank you so much, Yahira. Up next, big tech leading the way. Growth and tech has been the dominant force in, uh, in the U.S. and tech's done well in the rest of the world. But actually, you've done better running value. We think equity markets are set here for a consolidation phase or a, a pause for breath. Uh, and, and over the next few months, we have various risks that we have to digest as well. That elusive decline that everyone's been looking for. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. We are sort of parsing through these bank earnings and trying to understand the implication to the broader Q1 earnings read through. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Taking a look at the state of play, we are seeing declines deepen in the equity market on the heels of this. JP Morgan down 3.4 percent. They have been the high flyer among the bank stocks so far this year. Came out with disappointing net income interest, talking about costs increasing more than net interest income was supposed to come in. We see Wells Fargo down nine tenths of a percent. Citigroup up next. Next, they report earnings in about 43 minutes. Under surveillance this morning, big tech is leading the way, at least when it comes to the market rally. Growth and tech has been the dominant force in, uh, in the US and tech's done well in the rest of the world. But actually, you've done better running value. After this very strong rally, um, investors shouldn't be chasing the market at this point. And, and that's pretty consistent across our signal set. So, so we, we think equity markets are set here for a consolidation phase or a, a pause for breath. Uh, and, and over the next few months, we have various risks that we have to digest as well. Markets are sort of beating to multiple drums at the moment, and there's no consistency. I think that makes it very difficult for investors to really know how to position real time. And today is just another example example of that with sort of the whack-a-mole between what you see from J.P. Morgan earnings and the potential for some sort of AI adoption within Apple. Here's the latest. Big tech driving a rebound in stocks, at least yesterday after hotter than expected inflation data led to equity losses and pushed back rate cut bets. Linda Dussel, a Federated Hermes, is writing this. If the Fed doesn't cut in June, tough back, uh, back half CPI comps make some wonder if it will postpone rate cuts until next year. Linda joins us now. And before we get into, Linda, the sort of will they or won't they, how many cuts will there be, what is the relationship between rate cuts and the stock market, which hasn't been able to really figure it out in terms of exactly which direction to go? Uh, well, good morning. Thanks so very much for having me back again. And it's interesting about comps and it's interesting about looking back and then looking forward and what the market is expecting now, well, is a consolidation because it's been so very, very strong to this point. And uh, what might bring on the consolidation? And on all this talk about rate cuts, and we remember we started the year, we're going to have seven rate cuts, and then six, and then five, and then four, and then three, and the market does not care. The market has been concerned with earnings and whether or not we get a cut anytime soon, I don't know how interesting that is. We're now at Federated Hermes down to maybe one or two cuts this year, maybe later on, because June, if they were to cut, is right around the corner and there's no reason to do so. We can worry about rate cuts. 
but we're mainly worried about them and what the Fed is seeing as versus the outlook for the economy and earnings. And they have been surprisingly good up until this point. Well, let's go there then, Linda, because if earnings are the most important thing right now in terms of how you positioned, what's the read through from what we just got from the banks? So the financials are a very, very important part of the of the marketplace. Uh, your previous one of your previous uh, speakers was talking about value versus growth, growth in terms of earnings estimate. And the ones that we are all very familiar with are amongst the strongest as we look forward to what will be the earnings announcements for Q1. We're looking at the financial sector and the healthcare sector are two big sectors that we really need them to continue and cooperate and to grow with the rest of earnings and so that the markets advance can continue. And so when the, when some of the biggest banks, we all know those are the first groups that report, when they come out and say, yes, we beat on earnings and revenues, and we're not so sure about the future and our net interest income and costs are too high, then that makes us wonder about what their outlook for earnings will be. Because when I look at comps, and we all do. The fourth quarter of this year is which should be the best time for comps for these value sectors, financials being prominent among them and a big group in the S&P. So we can still look forward and expect maybe things will work out. But it's a great way, if you will, to start an earnings season where pretty much everybody wants this correction. And Jamie Dimon's statement talks about the persistent inflationary pressures and more may be likely to come. Then do you look at the earnings to learn more about what's going on in inflation than the backward looking CPI? Uh, yes, well, of course, it is backward looking, and uh, that's where our fingers are crossed. We've all seen the uh, the numbers come down. What our biggest worries, and you mentioned, and Marie, what our biggest worries should be, two of them anyway, are inflation and earnings. And inflation being the biggest problem, people can worry, as we, as we do in our business, as to whether or not inflation will move up again. We don't see really good evidence of that, notwithstanding the CPI numbers what we see is sticky disinflation. And we at Federated Hermes have been suggesting you're going to see that. And you're probably going to see that as a child of the 70s. You're probably going to see that for a lot longer than many people believe. And we're going to have to grapple with that. But it could be OK if earnings stay OK and earnings have been robust. And we are bullish on earning on earnings at Federated Hermes and going into next year as well. That's what we're going to probably come down to, because earnings tells us whether or not jobs will be preserved or unemployment goes up. Well, certainly at the moment, Linda, the economy looks strong. Uh, unemployment is low. With the narrative that you just put, I, I love it, which is child of the 70s. It's going to be OK. We're going to learn to live with inflation. But that's going to mean an extension of breadth. Breadth into commodity oriented stocks, breadth, we're seeing a, a rally in gold to all time highs, but we are seeing yields under a great deal of pressure. So, how do I live with it and prepare to live with it a little bit more? Sticky inflation, that is. Well, uh, uh, yes, thank you. And that's it's, uh, for a question that's very, very important is, is uh, in terms of what is going to happen and with breadth. And as you mentioned, you know, one of the reasons why the market has been so uh, so good this year is that even as names, big names like Apple have pulled back, you've seen other sectors uh, broaden in terms of their participation with this rally. And uh, the, the next logical step after the big cap techs is the rest of techs is then the big cap cyclicals, which is what we have been seeing. And that would include groups like the financials, but the breadth needs to carry on. And what about those regionals, those regionals banks where we all have the commercial real estate concerns going on and breadth that again is the child of the 70s. What about the small caps? We all have been expecting small caps to start to participate and join in with this, but their earnings have been not nearly as good as the large cap ones were. This is kind of a reflection of, of the bifurcation that you saw in the 70s. And lots of people believe that you need in interest rates to come down for small caps to get the relief, mm -hmm. to get the earnings, to join in. But they can't reduce interest rates because they see a recession, but rather because they think they've tamed inflation. And this will take longer than many people expect. Linda, just quickly, I only have about uh, 45 seconds. You said that everyone wants to sell off and that you're looking to earnings. What kind of sell off would you be looking for that would get you excited? We were talking to Jonathan Stubbs. He said double digits. 
Well, do, uh, double digits is what people are looking for. That's a decent correction. I don't know that it's appropriate to be excited for anything because if everybody's looking for something, they probably are not going to get it. There's still too much money on the sidelines. Here's what I know. The first quarter of this year saw the strongest advance in the S&P. It was like the, the 11th best since the 1950s. If I'm a student of history, that's a long time ago. And historically, the second quarter correction is mild. I position that against the uncertainty of an election year where you usually get a 15% pullback in the summertime. Yeah. But how uncertain are we really? We know these two people very, very well. Linda Dussel of Federated Herbies, thank you so much for being with us. Coming up, Apple overhauling its entire Mac line with new, get this, AI-focused processors. Everyone's so excited. That conversation up next with Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. We are seeing a bit of decline across the board after bank earnings kicked off Q1 earnings a little bit with a whimper rather than a roar. There is a question of whether this sort of sets a tone for the rest of the complex. No drama. Let's not get carried away. S&P futures down four tenths of a percent. Nasdaq actually down more after rebounding by a significant degree and outperforming yesterday down about a half a percent. Yesterday up uh, more than one and a half percent really led by Apple. We'll get to that in just a second, but also this belief that that will be the haven trade. If you take a look at sort of the reason why this is so interesting is bond yields have gotten to the highest levels of this year, pulling back a bit today from that. But the fact that stocks have been able to rally despite the fact that we're looking at a 4.9 percent two-year yield menace really is uh, causing a lot of people to wonder, is this a higher for longer regime that stock investors are okay with? Well, they're certainly becoming more comfortable with it. I mean, if you think it, it, it's a slow dissipation, you know, you go from six rate cuts back in January time to where we are now. You've got a couple of houses calling one and done and one and done in Christmas time. So you, you're actually going to live in a world of five, five and a quarter percent. Where do you want to be? And State Street would say that that's in a barbell approach, which is on the left hand side, it is cash. And on the right hand side, it is high tech with, high, with big balance sheets, cash deposits, earning money there versus the cost of capital. And also, you know, the end is not nigh. I mean, look at Apple. I mean, people were ringing the death knell for that company just a couple of weeks ago. You know, you're going to get me in trouble. Someone's Why? going to say that I set you up to say the end is not nigh, because that's sort of the sort of tone uh, that can happen. The end is not nigh, Anne-Marie. We're looking at a uh, dollar that is strong across me. the board. I do want to get a sense uh, with, within the uh, markets complex, commodities to me has the biggest attention today, given the fact that, yes, gold is at a record high. Oil price is rising once again. There is a feeling that a move is underway, and it's not a simple one to explain. It's not a simple one to explain because in some instances, it's a little bit different. Like copper's a little bit more idiosyncratic. It's not really geopolitical. It's the fact that these Chinese smelters may be cutting supply. So you have, uh, you have the demand, obviously, an issue there and the, stock, and the price moving higher. But across the board, what you're seeing is move into commodities today specifically on all of these geopolitical headlines we got overnight. And there's been a number of them, whether or not it's the U.S. warning to uh, Americans in the Israeli embassy. France has come out with a warning on a number of countries that are telling French citizens not to go. The world is bracing for this strike from Iran whether it's proxies, whether it's Iran, we don't know when, we don't know how, but we know it's coming. It seems like it's a hard needle to thread in order to retaliate without sparking a broader uh, kind of conflict. Under surveillance this morning, this really is what we've been watching over the past 45 minutes. JP Morgan and Wells Fargo kicking off bank earnings this morning. Both banks reporting net interest income that missed Wall Street estimates. Shares of JP Morgan trading lower in the pre-market, pretty materially. Wells Fargo shares actually uh, turning positive. JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon reiterating recent warning saying he remains, quote, alert to a number of significant uncertain forces. Manus, we've been looking under the hood, and really some of the things that stand out is that their net interest expense, how much they're having to pay out in interest, has been climbing. And J.P. Morgan's been adding to headcount, which also really speaks to the expenses, which is really different than a lot of the other banks that are trying to keep uh, their staff levels down or neutral. It depends where, where they're actually adding those headcounts. What we've seen, let's just square that away. What we've seen with a number of institutions and houses is they've been reducing headcount on certain product areas, but they've been adding within AI. Here we are with JP Morgan. Look, the story today about JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and we'll see it with, with, with the others when they come through, is what is happening on the net interest income. It was supposed to be guided higher. That's what the market was looking for. 
All the banks earned $250 billion. The biggest banks earned $250 billion last year in net interest income. And it looks on first flush that it might not just be as juicy for them on NII this year, but it is the first quarter. So we can all just breathe a little. Um, we have one bank analyst, Therapy. Octavio Morenzi, writing in and talking about no good deed goes unpunished. The only negative item was, of course, coming from that net interest income. They said everything else was quite well, and they're very bullish now what's going on. Everything else looked encouraging, but you could see how concerned the market is for this kind of environment, for net interest income, if rates are going to be higher for longer. And it also just speaks to how high the bar has gotten as J.P. Morgan continues to uh, chuck forward. Meanwhile, a slew of Fed spec, uh, Fed's Fed speak on data, <coughs> deck today. Excuse me. Happy Friday. It's going to be a weekend soon. Uh, a slew of Fed speakers on deck today. Let's try this again. As economists push back rate cut expectations following hotter than expected inflation prints, we'll hear from San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, Kansas City Fed President Jeff Schmidt, and at 9 a.m. Eastern, Bloomberg's Michael McKee will sit down with Boston Fed President Susan Collins, who came out earlier this morning in a Reuters report saying that she's now looking for a baseline of two rate cuts this year, Anne-Marie, rather than the three that the Fed had previously been projecting. And I want to hear what Mike has to say to her in terms of what the Fed is potentially not looking at, where are these unknowns, unknowns potentially coming from, and also how much does she push back on people like Linda Dussel we just heard from? Child of the 70s, we can live with higher uh, inflation, and the fact is, earnings will actually tell us if the job market will keep up. Is potentially there any inkling at the Fed to what Linda said, living with higher inflation, Mohammed Alarian has been talking about, maybe the Fed getting a little bit more comfortable, not 2%, but 2 to 3%. I think what's interesting is she actually went to the point of denying that a rate hike is, uh, is something that she's actually pushing back on. A rate hike is not part of her baseline. The fact that you've now actually got somebody in the Fed coming out and going, talking about rate hikes. No, that's not on our agenda. That just shows you, actually, if they're verbalizing that, that's how concerned they are. I think there's a lovely line from RBC. The rickety dam holding back the no landing narrative may be at stake. And that's what we're really here to debate, which is a no landing scenario. And that could be actually no cuts from the Fed this year. Well, this is something that Priya Misra has been talking about yes. at J.P. Morgan. This idea that if you actually get rate cuts pushed out for the remainder of this year, the way that markets work is they're going to start to price in some potential chance of a rate hike. That is just how markets work. This is what the Fed maybe wants to push back against. Is it going to be difficult? And will the stock market care? And that ultimately has been what we're trying to parse through all this morning. What influence will it have on a market that is pretty strong, which is the reason why we're so yeah. focused on the tech space, right? Because the tech has sort of been its own idiosyncratic secular story. Apple, let's get to this, preparing to overhaul its entire Mac lineup with a new in-house chips designed to highlight, that's right, artificial intelligence. This is according to Bloomberg reporting, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. The new design coming at a crucial time for Apple's computers. Sales of the Mac falling 27% in the last fiscal year. The company is seen to be falling behind its competitors in AI. Again, the reason why people are so excited about the adoption of this technology in a more intimate way. Joining us now, Mandeep Singh, Senior Technology Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Mandeep, how significant of a move is this by Apple? I mean, look, everyone has been waiting for that Empire Strike Back moment uh, when it comes to Apple because clearly they still have that install base and distribution on the smartphone side and also, I would argue, on the uh, notebook and PC side. And look, uh, they control the chip and the operating system. So that's unlike a lot of other companies on the PC side where Dell or Lenovo relies on you know, Intel to give them the chip. So that vertical integration has always been Apple's strength. And in this case, if they can incorporate the on-device AI that everyone is excited about, I mean, the mood of the moment is, what can you show me on the AI front? And Apple hasn't done that. If they can do it through this chip innovation, I, I think a lot of people will be excited about their prospects going forward. This may be a dumb question, Mandy, but where did this come from? Is this from the car unit that was disbanded and people basically were pushed over to another unit? Was this expected that they had this capability to really inject AI chips this quickly? I mean, look, they have been uh, investing on the AI side. It's just Apple is always secretive about what they do. And, uh, you know, when they launch a product, that's when you see the real innovation. They've been talking about how they are planning to use more flash memory for AI compared to DRAM, which is what a lot of the companies are doing on the server side. So, look, there have been investments going on, but 
in the end, you know, you have to show the results in terms of what it could do to a refresh cycle and how, uh, you know, on the software side, companies and the apps that are built on top of the Apple ecosystem can leverage that. So doing it at the chip level makes a lot of sense, but uh, I think you need to see it in the results in terms of how much refresh is, it's going to draw. Mandeep, we were so bearish on the China story on Apple. Um, Webber Securities uh, accused of all of us being perhaps uh, too bearish on the China story. And the market, to a certain extent, had got so bearish on the AI capacity of Apple. Here we are. It's one of the laggards in MAG7. This year, it's down 10%. This is not, in of itself, going to change the narrative for Apple and take us to $4 trillion, as Wedbush Security suggested it was going to make in market cap, is it? Uh, no, and look, the China revenue, the 20% revenue exposure they have uh, with China, that's going to continue to go down. I mean, clearly they have a lot to uh, do on the supply chain side in terms of relocating the supply chain. So with Apple, it's going to take a while in terms of both the revenue lift. They are the only hyperscaler that are growing, you know, low single digit when you compare them to Microsoft, uh, Alphabet and Meta and so on. And so clearly Apple has their uh, unique challenges when it comes to especially the revenue side and the China exposure they have. And that's not going to go away regardless of what they do on the AI front. Uh, Mendy, this morning we have the Wall Street Journal reporting that China is telling Chinese telecom companies that they need to ditch U.S. chips. We see the likes of Intel. We see the likes of AMD all down in pre-market based off this report. How big of an impact will that mean for them in terms of their earnings? How big of a blow could this be? Yeah, so the kind of exposure that Intel, AMD, and to an extent NVIDIA have to China has been going down, and especially with the incremental data spend, uh, center spend that we are talking about with AI, that's probably going to go down even more because every uh, sovereign realizes at this point of time that AI is driven by you know these latest chips, and you just can't afford to build it somewhere else. So it will be domestic, and in the case of China, I mean, that's what they're doing with all the infrastructure, it already happened with the handsets and the PCs, and now it's happening with critical infrastructure. And I, I think it will be a headwind for all the chip makers, including Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA. I, I think they will be impacted uh, as well going forward. And potentially it's just going to get worse when we see the geopolitical risk rise between Washington and Beijing. They want to develop more national champions. Is that just Huawei or there more? So Huawei has clearly shown that they have caught up to Apple in terms of the smartphone features. And that's what drove, you know, Apple's decline in revenue last quarter. And it's going to happen with every chip maker in the sense that long term, you know, five, 10 years out, you can model that revenue exposure going down to low single digit or uh, even to zero because, uh, that's what will happen, you know, in terms of the geopolitical tensions and how the sovereigns are kind of thinking, in, uh, especially around the chip sector. Mandeep, we've been talking all morning about how big tech has really outperformed, even in light of some of these uh, rate hiking expectations or not rate hiking expectations. Susan Collins put to bed that. But this idea that rates are going to be higher for longer. How much is this directly tied to that? The fact that they have such huge cash portfolios, as Manis was mentioning, and they're actually reaping benefits from this. How much is that this is still the haven and how much is this that investors are just confused and any good story that mentions AI will attract people's money? I mean, typically an inflationary environment is not good for ad spending. And, you know, in general, the tech evaluations tend to compress in times of high interest rates. Now, this uh, space is somewhat unique in the sense that these companies are being treated as, uh, you know, havens. And, and a lot of the money, the defensive money is flocking to the companies because clearly they're the most powerful companies, if you think about it from uh, a cash flow perspective. And so that, I think, will continue. But I wouldn't be surprised if you do see, you know, some pressure on their top lines uh, because of the inflationary pressures or if the interest rates remain at this level, especially on the consumer side. I think the enterprise side remains solid because all these companies have the CapEx budgets and they are growing that CapEx to, you know, invest in AI for the long term. But on the consumer side, you're not going to see a, a quick rebound on PCs or smartphone refreshes if uh, inflationary pressures remain. 
Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much. Just to recap some of the bank earnings, we did get J.P. Morgan, we did get Wells Fargo. They're both similar in missing on net interest income. Uh, interesting, J.P. Morgan stood out for actually increasing its headcount. Curious to see how much that actually does stem from some of the First Republic acquisition. Those shares lower by 2.1%. Also talking about an increase in interest expense, something like 49% uh, of an increase in interest expense at J.P. Morgan and a 76% over at Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo shares have turned positive. J.P. Morgan still lower. Citigroup on deck. Stay with us for that 8 a.m. Eastern in about uh, 16 minutes. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hawkins. Yahira. Hi, Lisa. KKR is taking a cue from Berkshire Hathaway by betting big on long-term private equity plus the resulting dividends. In an exclusive interview, co-CEO Joe Bay told our own Lisa Abramowicz the company expects to see $300 million of dividends in its strategic unit by 2026, with plans to double that by 2028. Berkshire Hathaway is an apt analogy in the sense that we look at a lot of business models, why certain firms have been super successful over time. And there are a lot of powerful messages in what Berkshire has built. It's the power of long-term ownership of assets, great businesses the power of compounding, and the, the real power of smart capital allocation within your business. The Biden administration is ramping up its aggressive economic stance toward China. The Commerce Department added six new Chinese companies to a blacklist on exports this week. That brings the total number of firms blacklisted by Biden to 319, the most of any U.S. administration, and topping the 306 that Donald Trump added while in office. And Samsung is preparing to announce a $44 billion investment into U.S. chip making as early as next week. It's a signature project in Washington's broader effort to bring semiconductor production back to America. Sources say the world's biggest memory chip maker plans to outline the project in Texas alongside Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. That's your Bloomberg Brief. Lisa? Thank you so much, Yahira. Up next, pushing back the rate cut timeline. The recent data have not materially changed my outlook, but they do highlight uncertainties related to timing and the need for patience. That's up next. This is Bloomberg. It is anything but boring. We are looking at markets that are digesting the one, two, three punch of CPI, PPI, and then bank earnings. Welcome back. We are seeing uh, the equity market retrace some of the declines from earlier as they really digest some of the earnings from the likes of J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo down about a quarter of a percent. And what we can see is a real question about what higher for longer means for banks. We are seeing this question of net interest income coming in beneath expectations at both J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. Question is is will a protracted high rate environment actually be a good thing or a bad thing? The perennial question. The answer often is it depends. Under surveillance this morning is that rate cut picture pushing back the rate cut timeline. The recent data have not materially changed my outlook, but they do highlight uncertainties related to timing and the need for patience, recognizing that disinflation may continue to be uneven. And this also implies that less easing of policy this year than previously thought may be warranted. Here's the latest. Treasury is looking to regain some of the losses as investors push back rate cut bets following yet another hot inflation print. Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, both of those banks now forecasting a first rate cut in December. Well, Colin Martin of Charles Schwab writes this. We are revising our outlook to two rate cuts this year from three, but that can change if inflation remains stickier than expected. Inflation is still high now, but we're not convinced it will reaccelerate. Rate cuts should be driven by the wish to normalize policy rather than a need to stimulate economy. Colin, di dissecting which is which has become increasingly difficult at a time where we don't know exactly where the neutral rate is. I want to start, Colin, on this idea of just how much you were, the data that we got this week really reset expectations. How much did it shift your understanding of how sticky inflation is and whether this inflation narrative really has legs? It, it did shift our understanding and expectations. Coming into the year and as recently as a month or even 
two weeks ago, we were still in the camp that three rate cuts seemed appropriate. If you go back to the end of last year, I mean, most inflation readings were continuing to fall. We saw annualized rates of close to 2% or so. And what we saw this week is that it is sticky. I mean, two months, maybe you can say that's a blip, but three months and the CPI beating expectations, that shows that it is sticky, and especially on the, the super core measure. I mean, that was concerning. Yeah, this is a reason why I think people are kind of struggling with what to do with this. Because on one hand, higher rates were thought to be good for risk assets because they came for the right reason. It was because it came on the heels of growth. Are we seeing that fundamentally challenged right now, especially as you see high yield kind of take, a, take it on the chin a little bit? You see people start to wonder, OK, higher for longer. What does that actually look like? Well, we think that is a risk there. If you look at high yield, it's, it's held in really well. If you told us that the Fed would hike aggressively, maintain and now actually risk holding for even longer and we'd see high yield spreads at three percent or less we, we would have said you're crazy that was not our expectation uh, so far they've done okay profitability remains really strong i think that's been a key driver but we're concerned about the for longer part because if you're an indebted company how long can you really withstand such high rates especially if you don't expect that profitability and the rate of profit growth to continue which we wouldn't expect as this uh, kind of recovery expansion continues we'd expect growth to slow and if you're seeing borrowing costs seven eight ten percent or more depending on credit quality we think that's a risk so we are still concerned with those risky parts of the market and we think a higher for longer is bad for risk assets so do you as you as you see the way forward there's no landing scenario seems to be building what whatever that will be but the fed and powell himself used the language restrictive that was just 10 days ago what is it that the fed needs to do do they need to do one to two insurance cuts is one or two cuts in insurance but then we go into an extended pause, as we had back uh, sort of 10, 15 years ago. I don't think they need to do that. We've heard Powell talk about Volcker and really the need to kill inflation. And I think the risk of cutting right now, especially given the, the still high inflation, I don't necessarily think that's the move. And I don't think they're going to go down that route because they know that the, the job and inflation is not done. We're seeing that from a lot of officials lately. If you go back a few months ago, there was a lot of optimism. And when they talk about rate cuts, I don't think it was the what's, need. What's the risk to this bond market? then if, if it is no landing, it's one rate cut, maybe even no rate cuts, do bonds then burst through to 5% or does real money come in at these levels? I, I think we start to see real money come in. To see yields move sustainably higher, I think it does go about back to the, to the neutral rate that Lisa just referenced. What is it and how restrictive is policy right now? The risk we see is if there is this no landing economy and inflation stays high, the Fed wants to kill that. And so we're afraid that if the Fed holds for a very long time or if they hike again, not our base case, but it's certainly okay. possible, we think that slows down things too much that we don't see yields surging. We see commodity prices higher. We see a wage growth really not ticking higher because all the supply is coming to the labor market. Why are you so sure that inflation won't reaccelerate? Is it because of that supply on the labor side? I think it's part of that. I think the Fed is committed to bringing it down. If we look at the labor side, it's still strong. We, 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 can't, we, we can't get past that. It's slowly weakening. You mentioned wages. I think that's important. If you look at wage gains, that has continued to trickle lower. If you look at a wage gain on an hour, uh, on, on a yearly basis, it's still coming down uh, versus sort of the stalling and potential reacceleration with inflation. So I think that's something we're really looking at. And if those wage gains do continue to fall, we're not convinced that we'll see a real acceleration in inflation. Colin, I want to tie, tie your world to the bank earnings that we just got. This idea that net interest expense at the biggest banks went up. And this speaks directly to the fact that everyone wants to park their money in money markets and clip four, four and a half percent rates. How much is this because right now investors view cash as an asset class, are very choosy in terms of where they go, and they want to get a higher yield and are demanding it so that these banks, even the biggest, have to offer that to keep their money? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're seeing it at Schwab. People are finding those opportunities. Now, we still think investors should move further out in the curve and lock in yields with certainty. But what we're seeing, not just at Schwab, but pretty much across all banks and brokerages, is that need for or, or interest in short term high yields. It, it's tough to argue against a money market fund at higher than 5% with very little price stability. We get that. And we're not saying investors shouldn't do that. But when you mention as an asset class, cash is an asset class. But if all your fixed income allocation or what should be earmarked for fixed income yeah. is in cash, then you sort of lose that diversification aspect. I guess I'm, I'm thinking about if it is uh, some sort of asset class, investors are going to be much more choosy 
about how much they get and are going to demand it. Do you find that the money is sticky or less sticky than we thought during the March financial crisis that wasn't uh, last year when it comes to sort of shopping around for the highest rate? Yeah, no, I think we'll see that. And, and, and investors and consumers are smart about that. They see what rates are out there. In this world we live in, you see numbers all the time, whether it's on TV, social media, it's hard to not see what's available elsewhere. So I think that's a good thing, though. You, you, you want investors to shop around and find the highest yield out there, uh, but always be cognizant cognizant of what those risks are. So I want to go back to that point that that yield we see in money market funds or T-bills, it's not permanent. Well, it's a good thing uh, if you're on the investing side. Maybe the banks will have a different story to tell when they have the earning calls. Uh, Colin Martin of Charles Schwab, thank you so much for being with us. Coming up, Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital. Ken Leon of CFRA will join us again as we break down Citigroup earnings. Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro to push back on the idea that inflation is going to surge higher from here. Jill Carey Hall of Bank of America on small caps, really an interesting asset class that may not catch up with large caps anytime soon. Right now, Anne-Marie, I know you're very closely watching the commodity space, which I'm very glad about because that has been a main driver. What do you think right now, based on the price movement and some of the forward expectations, are you seeing in terms of how significant the shift is right now with Iran preparing to strike? Well, I think what you're seeing, in, and you look at the call options in the options market, people see upside to Brent this summer. The question is, what happens after that? And this is the reason why people are looking at this as an inflation, disinflationary story. How do you factor this in? It's whack-a-mole today on uh, Bloomberg Surveillance. Right now, in markets, you are seeing a bit of a retracement from earlier losses. Bond yields lower for a change, down six basis points. Up next, Citigroup earnings. This is Surveillance. attention is really shifting to the earnings season. The max seven is not uh, particularly where you want to be, but you have to look at tech overall and really bet on quality, strong balance sheet. You want to see some earnings momentum in the other parts of the market. We are looking at this sort of broadening out of the recovery as the earnings story gets better for the have nots of 2023. I just look at what's been happening to this economy and I do think that we're going to be able to avert a recession. So we'll continue to see earnings continue to move higher. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm going to say it again. Let's get you to the weekend, although it seems like a long way away because we're getting a lot of information coming through. Good morning. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance uh, from New York City Live. We are here with Menace Cranny and Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Lisa Abramowitz. John Farrow off today on a well-deserved break. We have been talking about break earnings, and we did just get Citigroup earnings, just to give you a sense. They did beat across the board with actually their fixed income commodities and currencies trading and sales coming in at $4.15 billion versus the estimate of $4.15 one two billion net interest income coming in we're going to parse through all the numbers and we'll get there in a second Citigroup shares up about a half a percent but in the meantime this comes as a sort of motley drumbeat from jp morgan and wells fargo and marie i'm struck by the fact that they don't tell the same story when it comes to just how investors are receiving it but they do tell the same story when it comes to net interest income and that interesting expense it's all about net interest income and jp morgan on that miss is what is really dragging down the stock even though a lot of analysts are saying this was a pretty good report. Earnings expense as well. Guidance higher. Shanali was talking about this inflationary pressure even the banks are seeing. We're also going to get J.P. Morgan a media call around this time as well. So some of those headlines will be trickling down. Manis, what stands out to you as you sort of parse through everything we've gotten so far? The margin compression will spend more time with Shanali on. For me, it's about the, the, cre the credit provisions. They are materially lower in Wells and J.P.M. than they were estimated to be. Looking at Citi, Citi is going to be driven, it's, there's a banging number in here on investment banking, 903 million. The estimate was for 776, and that really, really plays to that spike at the start of the year that we were seeing across investment banking. The flow show was improving all the way around. Certain amount of that has dissipated as the quarter went on. Uh, so FIC doing really, really well as well there. But it's about the credit losses are materially lower than estimated at JPM Wells Fargo. I've yet to see the city number, but we'll get that. 
Well, we'll dig through this, and you mentioned Chanel, she'll be coming up in just a minute. What we are seeing in broader markets is a retracement from the earlier sell-off that we had been seeing uh, this morning. We're seeing a decline of about a quarter percent in the S&P. We're seeing dollar strength across the board continue. 106.54 on that euro, as it does seem like the ECB is preparing to cut rates in June. Ten-year yields, this is interesting. Have we reached the point of buying? A lot of people saying it looks like a buy, and yet we had a couple of auctions that were pretty messy this week. Ten-year yields now lower by almost Almost seven basis points, 452 uh, if you round it up. And crude a rallying, Emory. And we've been talking about this. This is sort of the drumbeat behind all of market activity. This question of at what point this becomes a uh, dominant feature in a market rally that has so far viewed this mostly as a demand story and not necessarily a shock. Well, right now, this is all about geopolitical risk across most of the commodity space. You see that with gold. There's been a lot of stories there. But today, it's really about this geopolitics because overnight, there's been a drip of stories that are a little bit more tangible than just reports of an imminent strike. You're seeing, you're seeing France. You're seeing alerts from the U.S. about certain embassies, where to and not travel. There's obviously intelligence behind this. And Israel is bracing for some kind of retaliation from Iran. And it's important to keep an eye on this because that's sort of the drumbeat in the background as we do focus on bank earnings as they come out. Coming up, iCapital's Anastasia Amoroso on why rate cuts don't pose a risk to the rally. Ren Max, Neil Dutta on why he sees an initial cut in July. And Bank of America's Jill Carey Hall on small cap risks. Right now, we do want to get some sense of what Shanali Basak is seeing in Citigroup earnings. Shanali, you've had a couple minutes. What's up? A few things. A lot of beats to look at here. And of course, you want to see uh, progress here for Jane Fraser in her turnaround story at Citigroup. Coming into this earnings cycle, they were trading at just over 60% of their price to book value here. So of course, Citigroup has a ways to go to catch up with these other banks. When you look at what they've done, what's most impressive perhaps is the gains that they're making in terms of beating on fixed income trading, equities trading, and investment banking. We talk a lot about that private credit competition. Interestingly, now you have JP Morgan and Citigroup beating on debt underwriting very meaningfully here. So you're seeing the banks come back with a vengeance to get that share in the markets. And you're you're seeing them really put their money to work to do so. I mean, this report card on Citi really plays to what Jane Fraser said when she was at the Citi, uh, sorry, the RBC Capital Markets Conference, which was, we are ahead on our program. And that's reflected. If you look at the inside the business, FIC is significantly uh, is, is, is a solid number. It's well ahead of what they had estimated. Likewise with equity sales and trading. So do you think the transformation of City is there another leg to go? Is there another evolution of that from Jane Fraser and the team? There certainly is. I would have to say those businesses right now are extraordinarily competitive because by and large, those businesses are kind of flat to down on Wall Street. But Citigroup, big global presence. And therefore, when it comes to fixing, I think that's income, a big differentiator with them as well, is the globality of their business. Absolutely. So yeah. what it does is give her a chance to gain share in security services, moving money in the ra- around the world, and also really gain share in those very volatile macro markets, which is why fixed income is so important for city. I would say, remember, she's doing this while basically changing almost every top position at the bank. That is the part that is perhaps the most striking about this beat. You have new leaders in almost all of these businesses, and some of them have not even started the job yet. Shanali, stay close. Thank you so much. Shanali Basik there. We do want to get a reaction. And frankly, iCapital's Anastasia Amoroso has been absolutely brilliant on being in risk during the risk rally. She is sitting here alongside us, Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital, chief investment strategist. We've gotten some bank earnings. I would love to just first get your reaction on what we've seen so far. Yeah, I'm not surprised that investors are having a bit of a difficult time parsing through bank earnings because there's not a clear-cut story uniformly positive or negative across all the different sectors of the banks. And the negative story clearly is the net interest uh, margin and kind of lack of improvement they are forecasting there. Look, if the Fed does not cut rates and if bank lending is not going to pick up and that's sort of the status quo that we have today, it's really going to be difficult to see sequential increases in net interest rate margin. So anybody who's over reliant on that core banking business, I think that's going to be kind of a lackluster story. Lackluster story, but then on the flip side, Lisa, I do think what's notable is the strength in trading and the strength in investment banking. I mean, Chanel is absolutely right. We're seeing a tremendous pickup in issuance of leveraged loans, of high yield uh, bonds, and also even uh, equity capital markets are picking up in the secondary part anyway. A lot of people used to think of the bank earnings, JP Morgan in particular, sort of kicking off the earnings cycle and setting a tone for the rest of it. You're bullish. You think that it doesn't matter whether the Fed cuts rates this, this year because there is enough strength underpinning some of what we've seen in the 
equity markets. Does this color your view at all, considering it's not being received all that well? Uh, no, not yet. And, you know, first of all, banks have done phenomenally well leading up to this very, uh, very data point. I mean, they've been outperforming, actually, or performing in line with the S&P. So I think a lot has been priced in. So that doesn't color it. And look, you know, the market right now is in a bit of a digestion period where we do have to reprice for the prospect of potentially no rate cuts understandably so that's going to take the market slower a little bit but what i actually like about the setup now is we came into april with weeks of overstretch overbought market conditions we came into the year with a 10-year that was probably not reflecting uh the growth environment we're going to have but now you fast forward to whatever date it is today you know almost <laughs> middle of april the 12th thank you Crushing uh, it. you know then you got the 10-year treasury um trading at a yield that is above what is implied by fair value. You have the overbought conditions that are not there, but we're sort of middle of the range. So you had a bit of a reset from the technical standpoint. So I like that. And then on the flip side, you know, what we also see, Lisa, is an acceleration in manufacturing, acceleration in the cyclical parts of the economy. It's not just the U.S. consumer. So I like that this is not just a one engine economy, but sort of maybe several things working in favor. Listen, all we've had this week is a little bit of a little bit of healthy volatility. Stocks did not get annihilated. They held up really quite well, given that bonds traded so viscerally this week. We wanted this small drawdown. Now, the question is, is this where you just see incrementally adding risk? Do you think we're going to get a more extended drawdown on this no landing scenario as it builds, as people believe less and less likelihood of cuts. I mean, things are going to slow yeah. down in terms of momentum. Yeah, no, I think the no landing scenario is good for markets. And I mean, think about it this way. If we can have an economy that is growing at 5% interest rate, so if I can participate yep. in the stock market and I can participate in the money market fund, that's a very healthy environment for investors. So, you know, one of the other things I was encouraged by so far in the technical front is that the NASDAQ 100, for example, dipped to 50-day moving average and sort of started bouncing off that level. If you look at the S&P, again, we're sort of, you know, we were toying with 50-day uh, and yet we're trading above that. So I think this story of cash on the sidelines, I mean, you know the stats, but 20 or 30 percent of private clients, uh, or 20 or 30 percent is the cash allocation or money market allocation for a lot of private clients. So I think that's why, man, as you see these dips and investors will come in as long as the economy is strong. Yeah, and there's lots of people out there hunting for the, be for the, for the best cash deposit out there. Um, the one thing that we did talk about over the past couple of hours was the resilience of the MAG-7 in terms of the, the mini ride that we have had and, and where money is holding out. There's a barbell approach, which is to cash and to big tech. Um, on mini drawdowns, it must be quite tantalizing to think about MAG-7 again. Everybody wanted to sort of divest yeah. and broaden out, but on dips, are they a buy? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's what we saw in the price action yesterday is we saw this strength coming out of the MAG-7 once again. But I do think, you know, one of our themes coming into the year was a broader opportunity set. Mm. And, you know, we still see that story playing out specifically in cyclicals. So, yes, I want to stick with parts of the MAG-7. I want to stick with parts of technology. But what's really interesting is the manufacturing momentum is picking up. Historically, that lifted cyclical parts of the stock market, uh, cyclical sectors and also regions. So that's why we look, of course, to the U.S. to have some of the highest earnings revisions momentum, but also Japan. That's why we look to industrials, materials, consumer discretionary, uh, semiconductors, of course, to have some of that upwards earnings momentum. So those would be the parts of the economy that I would be adding to. And the other point, man, is on rate cuts or lack thereof. Yeah. If the Fed doesn't cut rates, you know, you could have a little bit of pressure on valuations. But how do you offset that pressure? by higher top line growth and by higher earnings growth as well. So that's why if I have a cyclical that's actually accelerating this environment, I think that's exactly where you want to allocate. When you're looking at this commodity store and you see that momentum really globally, but also in the United States, do you think then what we're seeing in commodities and this rally higher is longer than just this temporary blip some are talking about? I do. I do. You know, first of all, owning oil here, of course, is a geopolitical hedge. It always has been. It likely always will be. And so, you know, what's happening in the oil market is we're seeing uh, lower inventories that are being drawn. We're seeing better balances for the rest of the year. And so, of course, you have the geopolitical risk premium that I think, unfortunately, is here to stay for some time. But outside of oil, um, I do think you have, again, this pickup in the industrial complex. And when we look at the data, the average manufacturing upturn lasts about nine months. 
So this is not a blip, but likely several months uh, worth of trend. And if that's the case, commodities like copper, aluminum, some of the industrials should also participate in that. And they historically have um, outside of COVID. Anastasia Amoroso, thank you so much for being with us so much. of I Capital. Before we get to uh, some of the other things to watch, uh, Shanali Basik still here. Just quickly, is there anything that stands out as you parse through the deeper look at Citigroup? I'm looking through just how much you earn in one of their key businesses, the security services, right? You have closer to 5 6% returns on common equity or for the whole business. When you look at the security services business, that is way higher. And it just shows you the direction of travel that is the potential potential for Citigroup to start to reach as they invest. You have the first couple of words in their presentation, Lisa, relentless. And I think that sets the tone for what Jane Frazier is trying to get across to the street. And this was a component of the CPI as well, that the security service increase in terms of inflation. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hakes. Yahira. Hi, Lisa. The Wall Street Journal reporting that China, China has told telecom carriers to phase out foreign chips by 2027. The move part of China's ongoing effort to phase out American technology. Chipmakers Intel and AMD cited as likely being hit particularly hard by the change. Officials are pushing firms to inspect their networks for any non-Chinese chips and draft a timeline for replacing them. Oil is resuming gains to end the week. Crude markets are bracing for possible strikes by Iran on Israeli targets. Bloomberg is reporting that U.S. officials and allies believe Iran may attack in the coming days. The move would be in retaliation for an Israeli attack on its embassy in Syria. The news comes as Russia has stepped up attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure in recent days. U.S. Steel shareholders will vote today on a bid by Nippon Steel to take over the company. Investors are expected to approve the deal, but it's coming under growing scrutiny from regulators, lawmakers, and President Joe Biden. Nippon is offering $55 per share for a total of $14 billion, which would make it one of the largest steel mergers ever. That's your Bloomberg Brief. Lisa? Yeah, hi, Rahakis. Thank you so much. Up next, big, bank, big banks kicking off earnings season. The first quarter of the year is always the strong quarter for investment banking. Yes, there's numerous geopolitical risks out there, but unless the markets really collapse, which we don't expect, we expect to see a decent investment banking year. That's coming up next as we dissect the Citigroup earnings. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. We got a lot going on today as we look at we've got a lot going on today as we look at bank earnings as we look at the potential for a stickier inflation what we're seeing right now is a bit of a sell-off although no drama compared to what we saw on Wednesday we see the S&P futures down three tenths of a percent dollar strength across the board we do see a gaining momentum into the bid for treasuries compelling after a couple of messy auctions 10-year yields now 451 14 but when you take a look at where we've come from wow it's been quite a ride considering the fact that we've risen some 20 basis points in one day, and we're really resetting the idea of rate cuts across the board. Under surveillance this morning, big banks kicking off earnings season. The first quarter of the year is always the strong quarter for investment banking. First quarter of this year, most of the banks are expected to report investment banking results that are plus anywhere from, let's call it 10 to 11 percent to plus 18 percent year over year growth. Yes, there's numerous geopolitical risks out there, but unless the markets really collapse, which we don't expect, we expect to see a decent investment banking year. Meanwhile, what we're seeing from Citigroup is with their first quarter of FIC sales and trading revenue coming in pretty much in line, although a slight beat. J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo reporting net interest income that missed Wall Street estimates. CFRA's Ken Leon back with us. Ken, you've seen Citigroup, you've seen uh, J.P. Morgan, you've seen Wells Fargo. Can you put the three together and come up with any kind of theme that stands out to you? You know, I think these banks are delivering and they got plenty of upside if we have a healthy economy, which we think we will. 
We're seeing pretty good loan activity. We're just at the very beginning of the game in terms of investment banking. So those beats in that area was really related to record debt underwriting. But equity underwriting and M&A still have way to go. Uh, we also saw a lots of concern about net interest income. But what also makes net interest income an opportunity is the flywheel of higher volumes, whether it's in loan or for city and treasury and trade activity. Uh, there's opportunities here, uh, particularly with the strong economy, for these banks to surprise on the upside. I think the managements are being conservative. Uh, East City is holding firm on higher revenues this year in their guidance, although net interest income is likely to be moderately lower, but I think that might be a beat as we get later in the year. So I think there's opportunities here for the large banks uh, to really be still strong participants in the equity market, and they're really dependent on for the financial sector for investors to do well. With Citigroup in particular, as it just crossed uh, about 20 minutes ago, how much is this an endorsement of what we're seeing from Jane Frazier and her overhaul plan? It's a great question. And what we're seeing in the results, but also in the presentation and the narrative, is transparency of a rock-solid strategy. Uh, they did bring in new management at different levels. Of course, they've reduced the management structure but city's not going to be all things to all people. No longer the supermarket, this Sandy Wheel era. This is going to be a bank that's highly focused and relentless uh, to be a partner for institutions on global trade, uh, to be best in class in terms of global wealth management, and then also uh, to look for opportunities uh, where city can really leverage that connectivity around the world. But they still exited 14 non-U.S. consumer bank locations, and they're being smart in terms of freeing up capital. Good for investing in the business. It's also good for return of, a, of capital to investors. And Jane herself said this is a cleaner, simpler management structure that fully aligns to the facilities of our strategy. With that in mind, what is the... What what is the next evolution here, Ken, as you look at JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citi? Is Citi just a much bigger global eco play relative to JPM and Wells Fargo? Yeah, so they're, they're all very different. And I think JP Morgan is, is best in class in terms of institution, consumer, and for business lending. Wells Fargo, we actually view more to be more of a U.S. super regional bank and one that would be more compared to a PNC or a U.S. bank. And then Citi, uh, it's interesting, and this question came up last quarter here on Bloomberg, is going to be more of a streamlined bank, not all things to all people, mm -hmm. and, and be really effective in certain areas where it can be a top three player. Um, bank of New York of Mellon, you know, I think of different banks that are more specialist versus being versatile and being everything uh, to their customers. We now have these three major banks on tap. Next is going to be, of course, Morgan Stanley and Goldman. What we know from these three banks, what are you expecting from the other two? Well, I mentioned it before, is we had record debt underwriting. Uh, it was the highest since 1980 in the first quarter. That's a positive because that means corporates and CEOs are looking for capital raise, whether it's in debt and soon to be equity. Uh, we think when we look at investment banking, uh, it's going to be um, improving. So I, I, I think Morgan and Goldman, Goldman Sachs are probably going to be conservative. But what they're going to talk about is the durable recurring revenue of their fees uh, so that it's not the volatility of whether we had a good quarter in trading or investment banking. Um, I think David Solomon is going to be coming out with a lot more confidence because we're really looking in the rear mirror to all of the problems we've had before with the consumer banking and diversifying. This is a rock solid business that's adding an asset management and moving into private equity and private debt. So opportunities here for these two banks. Unfortunately for Morgan Stanley, the headline news from yesterday is uh, there's a lot more government scrutiny to some problems that have come up related to wealth management. So that's a little disconcerting.
Ken, just quickly here, I'm curious about what this means for the smaller banks, considering that they don't necessarily have the same kind of banking engines that can offset the declines in net interest income. We look at them very closely, and our team still feels that there is risk exposure here uh, to, uh, of course, commercial real estate. Uh, they're much more rate sensitive. But my analysis would be that the small banks are like small cap stocks. Because when we look at equity investing and the institutions, uh, there's about 12 constituents of the financial sector that are 65% of the weighting. And six of the largest banks are there. So as you go further to the smaller banks, they become of less consequence for investors. But they're incredibly important, of course, for our U.S. economy. Ken Leon of CFRI, thank you so much for all your time with us as we parse through uh, the big three that reported. Honestly, fascinating to me, the net interest income pressure, Emory, that's something that just keeps coming uh, back. This question of are higher rates good thing or bad thing for banks? So basically just have we priced in too much optimism? Priced in potentially too much optimism. It also depends on what the bank is. Big banks can deal with higher interest rates. Smaller banks, not so much. What's catching my attention now is a readership spike and what Jamie Dimon is saying. Mm. And he's saying the most important thing to the future of the free world is what's going on with global geopolitics. Potentially, that could mean more of bad economic outcomes. Well, and this is a reason why uh, he was talking about some pessimism, despite some of the optimistic sense for his business. We will keep on top of that. Coming up, we're going to be speaking with Ren Max, uh, Neil Dutta on why July could be the earliest rate cut, basically saying, everybody calm down, they're still going to cut rates. So stop talking about rate hikes and all of that. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. What a week. We started with CPI and PPI, and now we've got the kickoff, the official kickoff to Q1 earnings. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance in Markets. We are seeing uh, just a bit of a decline as we parse through what we've gotten in terms of a hot inflation read on one hand, softer inflation print on the other hand, and then bank earnings that came in fine, but not as good as expectations. S&P futures lower by three tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq 100 down by a half a percent. Manis, you've been on this talking about how this really has been the leader in in terms of the rebound yesterday, now leading on the way down, how much is just the, this the new beta that goes up and down the most? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's the narrative out there is that Mag7 is a resilient zone for you to go and sit in in these hard times, stick your money in cash, get your CD, get your get your deposit fund, and that is the barbell approach. What you've had this week is a much more virulent upset in bond markets than you have relative to equity markets. If you just look at the bonds. Up 13 basis points this week. I know we give a couple of bips back this morning, but over the past two weeks, 33 basis point rising in 10-year government bond yields. Okay, you give five back this morning. I will grant you that, but you just look at this divergence. There's a global divergence at play between Europe and the US. Global bonds have been routed down nearly 5% this year. That's the Bloomberg Global Bond index. Are you brave to buy? <laughs> and that's the reason why you're seeing this bleed through the currency market, which is basically yes. strong dollar, weak euro, weak everything else. But the euro in particular, 106.48, squarely through just a couple days ago, was north of 108. Let's get straight to it. Under surveillance this morning, big banks kicking off earnings season. JP Morgan and Wells Fargo broadly beating Wall Street expectations. However, and this is the key, both missing estimates for net interest income. Citigroup, meanwhile, reporting first quarter FIC, fixed income commodities and currency sales and trade revenue in line with estimates. Next week, we'll hear from Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley. Man, as I'm struck by what we heard from Ken Leon, which is essentially you can expect Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley to probably outperform when it comes to the banking side and trading side, because that was an outperforming area in the likes of JP Morgan and Citigroup. Yeah, I mean, they've, and they've both done really quite nicely. We've had good volatility. It would appear that we have had good volatility rather than bad volatility, if you can imagine to dissect that. But on, on a more serious note, there was an uplift. There was nice rates volatility throughout the first quarter uh, as, as we shifted from six rate cuts to four rate cuts to no rate cuts and no landing. So volatility has been there on the rate side and likewise in FX as well. So those component parts, but there just hasn't been the carry through in the IPO and the M&A. M&A, we had a bit of a flourish and then it just seemed to run out of steam. But right now, the credit losses 
are not as bad in both Wells Fargo and JP Morgan as was estimated by the market. And that tells me something about U.S. exceptionalism. I knew I forgot the word earlier on. It's U.S. exceptionalism. Meanwhile, uh, what JP Morgan did with interest margins and borrowing, et cetera, et cetera, it doesn't even matter because he came out, Jamie Dimon, and said that he's worried about geopolitical reasons uh, and concerns that might trump other things. Which brings us to China. President Biden surpassing Donald Trump when it comes to blacklisting Chinese entities. The Commerce Department adding six Chinese companies to an export blacklist this week as the White House continues to try to kneecap China's access to U.S. chips and technology. The move bringing the total number of firms blacklisted by Biden to 319. That compares to 306 fewer that Trump added while in the White House. Emory, you've been pointing to this and talking about this with respect to what's going on with Intel. How much is this sort of a drumbeat that just keeps on getting louder, even if other stories kind of overwhelm it? I mean, I think one thing you can take from this is the signal that whether or not it's Trump 2.0 or Biden 2.0, export controls on China will continue, regardless of who is in the White House. And then you wake up this morning, you see the, what the Wall Street Journal reports, that China is telling their telecom company that they cannot use U.S. chips. You're starting to see the tit for tat. What does that mean for Intel, NVIDIA? All these companies are going to want to lessen their China exposure because China's not going to allow them to use their chips. And then you're going to see a ton of national champions in China, like Huawei. Which is the reason why we are watching import and export data pretty closely. We'll get to that in one second. We just got a slew of new information under surveillance this morning. Fed President Susan Collins urging patients before easing. Collins saying, quote, the recent data have not materially changed my outlook, but they do highlight uncertainties related to timing. This also implies that less easing of policy than previously thought may be warranted. Bloomberg's Michael McKee, our own, will be speaking with President Collins this morning at 9 a.m. Do not miss that. Mike joining us uh, now to talk about that. But before we get there, Amory talking about the tip for tat and imports and exports. We did just get some import uh, and export price data. What does it tell us? We got to cap the week with some more inflation news that oil prices are expensive, but other imports are not at this point. Uh, according to the BLS, import prices went up by four tenths of a percent during the month of March. That's more than the three tenths last month, more than the three tenths anticipated. But take petroleum out and oil pla uh, and import prices were completely flat. Uh, which is an improvement on the one-tenth of a percent rise the month before. And, of course, in January, we had a big rise of eight-tenths of a percent. So things are uh, looking better on the import price front, with the exception of oil. Year-over-year -year basis, import prices up just uh, four-tenths of a percent. So maybe we're seeing the possibility of a turnaround on this whole inflation thing. And you notice that uh, all the people, all, all, all of my nerdy economist friends who do the translation between CPI, PPI, and PCE are saying PCE could come in much lower than CPI. So uh, that's definitely something to ask Susan about. Do you, yeah, I was going to say, are you, when you speak to Susan Collins, do you think it's something she's going to push back on? We have to wait to see the PCE. We have to remain this confident, see more data. But how concerning, if you're sitting at the Fed, is commodity prices, especially going into the summer when everyone is, was expecting a cut? Well, it, it's concerning, but not overly so in the sense that the Fed can't do anything about commodity prices. You can raise interest rates all you want. Gasoline prices are going to go up or down uh, independent of that. Same with uh, other commodities. So the Fed can't affect that. So they have to look through that sort of into the things that they, they can affect. What I think it'd be interesting to talk about, and I know she's probably listening to me right now, is uh, she and others have said, we don't need to act right now. The markets are all taking this as a turning point. And they've priced out everything except maybe one and a half cuts this year. Is it a turning point or is this just overreaction by the markets to one data point? That's a great question. I'm going to pose it to our next guest. Michael McKeith, thank you. Great job. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your interview with Susan Collins. Ren Max, Neil Dutta joins us now with an answer to that question. Is this a pivot point this week or is this something that just is more noise, more bumpiness to the same road to easing policy? Well, I think the latter. I think it's a bumpiness on the path to still um, a couple of cuts this year. Um, you know, you kind of have to take the data as it comes to you. Um, and certainly uh, what we learned in the last week definitely throws a bit of cold water on the idea that residual seasonality was a big driver for why, um, you know, we sort of missed the boat on inflation uh, the first couple of months of the year because March was 
still somewhat firmer. Um, you know, the PPI data certainly took some of the edge off uh, in terms of what it means for PC. But at the end of the day, you're talking about core uh, inflation, uh, PC inflation likely to be running above uh, 3% over the first three months of the year. Uh, so the way I'm thinking about it is, um, you know, July at the earliest. We had, we had three months of poor inflation data. And you're going to need at least that many months uh, to undo the damage. Uh, so lots of things have to go right. Um, but I think July at the earliest is probably uh, the way the way I would think about it. And if you get another bad inflation number, you just push it out. I mean, Lisa, I do think it's worth reminding people that, um, you know, the late I mean, you have to kind of go back to first principles in these sort of situations. Right. I mean, we know the labor markets are cooling. We know that inflation expectations haven't really moved. If you look at surveys of consumers and households. Uh, so at some level, that would that suggests to me that consumers are somewhat resistant now uh, to taking on higher prices. And so if this continues, I'd, I'd be frankly more worried about corporate profit margins than anything else. Well, Neil, this really raises a question about whether this sort of challenges a bullish thesis in equities more significantly than people are realizing. If you do see slowing under the surface, if you do see people pushing back on prices, the inability for companies to pass along things like oil prices and other commodities that are coming up, how much does that really make you less optimistic about what we get in the equity market? Well, I mean, right now, the markets are kind of trading right at any given point in time. I think you could basically say, you know, the economy is, you know, one of four things, right? We could talk about soft landing, sort of, you know, solid growth, benign inflation. We could talk in, about inflationary boom or you could talk stagflation or a recession, right? Deflationary bust. And right now, I think the markets are kind of thinking inflationary boom like dynamics. I mean, that's an environment where, um, you know, stocks can work, bonds can't. Um, but, um, you know, if you kind of move towards the situation where inflation stays sticky, that begins to erode household incomes, uh, it keeps the Fed off on the sidelines, uh, then you're talking about a situation where equity markets will come under more pressure. Um, you know, I don't think we're there yet, but, you know, certainly if we can, because I think inflation will cool. Uh, but if it doesn't, then uh, you have to be cognizant of that risk. And that's maybe what the bond markets, Neil, good morning, the bond markets have been trying to price. They did 30 odd basis points in the space of two weeks. We've gone a little bit back this morning. We've had a couple of auctions this week, which it took more to encourage people to buy the 10s and buy the 30s than it has for a long time. Now, that's because of market dislocation. But I'm looking at my inbox from Torsten Slock, and he says, we are seeing the first signs of U.S. financial stress appear. Trailing Treasury auctions, rating agencies issuing opinions about deteriorating fiscal situation and term premium trending higher. What do you make of that, the dislocation in the auctions this week? Idiosyncratic or something more malevolent? I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, I think financial conditions have tightened. If you look across a range of different indicators, right, the dollar's going up, corporate credit spreads have tightened. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that it's uh, a significant dislocation yet. I mean, I, th I still think that, you know, financial market conditions, um, you know, have largely repriced because inflation has been higher. So, you know, that's going. So in other words, inflation's higher. It's going to take a little bit weaker growth to get uh, inflation back to where the Fed wants it. And so you're seeing financial conditions tighten. I don't think it's anything beyond that just yet. Uh, Neil, we have some more news. We've been reporting all week that this attack potentially from Iran on Israel was going to be imminent. And we have reporting that it's going to be within the next 48 hours. We've seen a few signals from that, whether or not it's the U.S. directing embassy personnel in Israel where they should and should not go. France telling cert putting certain countries on uh, no travel lists. Last time we spoke, you pretty much shrugged off geopolitics. At this point, how can you not say that this is not concerning at all to what is going on when you look at the global marketplace? Well, you don't shrug it off. You just, I mean, you take it as it comes to you, right? I mean, in my experience, like changing a fundamental forecast based on what's going on geopolitically is usually, um, you know, by the time you start doing that, usually the crisis is over. That's in, that's in my, my experience. Now, what I will say, to me, the most interesting thing is just the relationship between what's going on in the energy markets and the dollar. You know, historically, everyone's thought, you know, dollar uh, down, oil up. But, be, but given the U.S. position as a major commodity exporter, and you know we run a net surplus in, in petroleum, um, you're seeing uh, you know stronger oil prices 
boosts the terms of trade of the U.S., and that strengthens the dollar, right? So the causality is actually from oil to the, the exchange rate uh, in the U.S. I think it matters more, frankly, for um, emerging markets or, uh, you know, sort of uh, oil importers globally, because not only are they dealing with high, higher oil prices, they're also now dealing with weaker currencies. And that's going to limit the ability of those central banks to cut interest rates, which has been a reason for some of the enthusiasm and global uh, global risk appetite, right? Um, so I think it's uh, it, it introduces a little bit more uh, tighter financial conditions, particularly in the rest of the world, I think, more so uh, than the U.S. Yeah, before we let you go, it sounds like you're a little less bullish than you have been of late. Is that true? Well, yeah, the data hasn't gone my way. How do you expect me to sell? You know, I mean, you know, you have to be honest with yourself, right? So, um, but I'll, I, I will just say, I mean, I do think um, we're ultimately when uh, the dust settles on 2024, we will still be talking about a situation where the U.S. economy is growing and the Fed will be cutting. That is, you know, I think still the fundamental story. And honestly, Neil, the data hasn't gone anyone's way because no one's been able to game this out. Remax, Neil Dutta, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate that. Just to note, a, uh, AMH, we've been looking at 10-year yields uh, falling on the heels of this report in particular. It seems like Treasuries are still a haven bid, and you know we're seeing that kind of blood through the market. We've been talking about the signals that are coming from the United States, coming from France, coming from Israel, actual tangible signals about where people should and should not be. This obviously has to do with some potential intel they have about what an Iranian strike would look like. And now our reporting is that it's going to happen within 48 hours. And this is why the markets are very concerned. And we're seeing that kind of bled through the action. Right now, let's get you an update in stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hakas. Yahira. Hi, Lisa. Apple is preparing to overhaul its entire Mac computer line with a new set of in-house processors designed to highlight AI. Sources say the tech giant is also nearing production of its next generation chip, the M4 processor. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman says Apple is aiming to release the updated Macs beginning late this year. Kathy Wood's ARK Investment Management announcing it holds a stake in OpenAI. It's the latest in, the, in a string of high-profile investments into the Silicon Valley darling, the biggest coming from Microsoft investing $13 billion. This comes as Kathy Wood's most famous vehicle, the ARK Innovation ETF, has been struggling. After years of gains, it stumbled this year due to a decline in Tesla stock performance. And Bloomberg reporting that Israel is bracing for a potential direct attack from Iran in the coming days. People familiar with the matter saying it could come as soon as the next 48 hours. Those same sources telling Bloomberg the move has not yet been approved by Tehran's highest ranking officials. The U.S. is preparing defenses and has moved additional, addition, additional military assets to the region and is stepping up diplomatic efforts as well. That's your Bloomberg Brief. Lisa? Yeah, Hira, thank you so much. As always, up next, the risk of higher for longer. The risks are looking more tilted towards inflation stays even higher for longer than we've had. And the risks are looking that the Fed starts that, that easing cycle a bit later. That's coming up next right now in markets. You can see a bid into bonds on the heels of increasing geopolitical concerns. All of that coming up next. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome back. We're dealing with the fact that we've got bank earnings on one hand speaking to strength. We see CPI pointing to strength and ongoing inflation pressures. And then you have a geopolitical risks that are really fueling a rally in the commodity space pretty much across the board. Uh, when you do take a look at markets, crude back up north of 2% gains, $86.76 uh, on the WTI. AMH has been talking about it. We will continue to break it down in terms of the latest from Israel. Under surveillance this morning, the risk of higher for longer still have the Fed cutting in June, uh, but I think the risks around that forecast have changed. The risks are looking more tilted towards inflation stays even higher for longer than we've had, and the risks are looking that the Fed starts that, that even cycle a bit later. So we're holding on to those similar views, uh, but I think the risks have definitely tilted in a different direction.
Here's the latest Fed officials urging patience. New York Fed President John Williams signaling there's no need to cut in the, quote, very near term, whatever that means. And Richmond Fed, Fed President Tom Barkin saying it is smart to take our time. Bank of America's Jill Carey Hall writing, quote, we think the uncertainty overhang may challenge relative performance of the Russell 2000 for now, given higher for longer rate risks. Small is likely to lag large until later this year if and when we get more confidence in cuts. Jill Carey Hall joining us now. And Jill, this has been always a fascinating discussion. If we're getting this sort of cyclical boom, why are we not seeing it in the small caps? You're saying it's completely hinged on rate cuts. And if we don't get them, we're not going to get that rebound this year. Yeah, and thanks for having me. I mean, we we talked to a lot of investors, and I think there there has been this year more optimism on small caps. We've seen that in the the inflows that we track. But I think in in all of the conversations that we have, investors have sort of been looking to the Fed as the next catalyst for why the Russell two thousand could could move higher from here. Um, you know, corporates in general, especially when you look at the S and P five hundred, they've locked in long dated low rate debt, but. For smaller companies within the Russell, about 40% of their debt is either short-term or floating rate. So, you know, we, we estimate this could be a pretty significant hit to earnings over the next five years if rates were to, to stay high um, relative to, you know, if we see cuts, then, then this becomes a less detrimental headwind. Jill, forgive me for sort of the hypothetical here, but what does it take to get some sort of fuel to this particular sector? Is it just one rate cut? Is it just taking the prospect for even higher rates off the table? Or do we need to sort of see the beginning of a protracted rate cutting cycle that could bring some of these expenses, interest expenses, back into something similar to the past? Right. I mean, I think, you know, what one cut isn't necessarily just going to solve the problem. I think, you know, given how elevated rates are, our our economists are now expecting that we'll see a cut in December. They had pushed that back from June um, and, and four cuts next year. So I think if we get greater confidence that we're on a path to, to lower interest rates um, so that when these companies do have a lot of debt coming due over, you know, 2025, 2026 and beyond, um, that that refinancing won't be as big of an impact back to earnings as it could be now if rates stayed at these levels. Um, I think a lot of the the macro positives for small caps still stand, um, the profits recovery. But, you know, another risk there is that the profits recovery this year is very back end loaded. Earnings are still going to be negative year over year this earnings season. Um, consensus is looking for small cap earnings to recover to about 30 percent year over year by the time we get to the fourth quarter. So we'll be paying a lot of attention to guidance this earning season. Um, so that could, you know, potentially if, if we, things do come through, set us up for a better year end rally for small caps. If we have confirmation that the back end loaded earnings recovery is coming through and if we have confirmation that, OK, inflation is cooling and the Fed is going to cut, um, which, is, as I mentioned, is our economist's forecast now for December. Jill, good morning. I'm looking at the, the breadth trade and the Russell 2000 energy is at the top there, up over 10 percent and tech. And um, when you look at the commodity complex, we're talking about oil around this desk this morning, uh, geopolitics with Amory, the warnings that are there. We're looking at oil. We're looking at copper. We're looking at a, some kind of a new cycle within the breadth narrative within the Russell 2000. How do you play commodity strength and will it endure? Well, I think, you know, the, the good news around the commodity oriented sectors like energy and materials and industrials is that they are some of the sectors that have lower refinancing risk um, relative to, to sectors like real estate that could see a much bigger earnings hit. So I think within within small caps, if you're an investor right now, you want to be selective. And, and some of these commodity oriented sectors are one way to do that because they they will benefit from, from higher commodity prices, you know, manufacturing, GDP improving, but they're less sensitive to, to refinancing risk. So so that's one area that, that we see is relatively better positioned within Smith and we'd stick with higher quality stocks and, and stocks that don't have a lot of leverage or, or short-term or floating rate debt. And then I pivot 180 and I look at the lags in, in the Russell 2000 and it is in the financials. We're getting information through from JPM, from Wells Fargo, from Citi, and it is about the net interest income. Uh, and that story incrementally under a bit of pressure, but is that more pressure to come in financials in the regional banks? 
so within within banks, we'd we'd favor large over SMID banks for now. Obviously, the the regionals have been been challenged, and you know, overall, this is a, a sector within the the Russell that's sensitive to 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 credit conditions and to you know the the Fed. So you know, that's an area that even though it's ranked relatively well in our our quant work, we're we're relatively cautious or more selective within right now. We'll see what all of the banks continue to say this earnings season, watching guidance pretty closely. U.S. corporates overall had had guided relatively weakly in in the last three months. Guidance usually is weaker at the start of the year, so we'll see if we see any improvement there. Um, but but in addition to financials, real estate is another one that you know we're we're more cautious on in, in small caps and does have you know more more risk from refinancing. Jill Carey Hall of Bank of America, thank you so much, as always, as we try to parse through the different cost currents and the whack-a-mole of narratives. So just to sort of recap today, we've gotten J.P. Morgan earnings, Wells Fargo, Citigroup kicked off. Basically, they did great. It's just that they didn't do quite as well as a lot of people had expected. You pointed, Manis, to a quote from J.P. Morgan. Just share it with us. Jamie Dimon, increased dividend because our capital cup (laughs) <laughs> runneth over. I mean, it's just, it's, it's the dawn of Wall Street, the king of Wall Street, and just go, I've got it all. Well, you know, to a certain and I'm degree, give it away. they do have it all in terms of they've got a lot of cash coming in, but not quite as much as people thought with the net interest income coming in below expectations, the net interest expense coming in above. We're also watching commodity prices really coldly, uh, closely. Gold making a new all time high, copper the highest since 2022. And then, of course, oil prices just continuing their march, Anne Marie. And I got to say, it's definitely causing a question of what this means in light of a strong dollar, in light of a lot of people talking about industrialization. And then what this means for inflation. And you have to think we're going into a weekend that now is going to be tense with a lot of geopolitical risk. Our reporting is that within it could be as soon as 48 hours, we would see some sort of retaliation. And all morning, we've been pointing to the actual tangible actions. The United States, France are sending warning signals about individuals who are in Israel. The questions into the weekend, Iran wants to show capability. What does that mean? Because they told the Germans it would be, quote, appropriate. But... This could just be us walking in with a bigger premium on oil come Monday morning. And what's interesting is that there is a strong bid, a stronger bid into Treasuries on the heels of some of the risk-off concerns. Coming up on Monday, PIMCO's Andrew Balls, Peter Shear of Academy Securities, KBW CEO Tom Michaud, and New York Fed President John Williams. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.